This week on RSVNB Update, it's Quest Week and Desperate Measures is here. We cover the quest front to back. We talk lore, gameplay, differing points of view, and what it all means for the World Garden. Then we top it off with questions of Elder God proportions. This is RSBNB Update, episode 788, recorded Thursday, July 30th, 2020, from a certain point of view. Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us for another episode of RSBNB Update. This week, of course, is Quest Week, one of the one of the few quest weeks that we've had. These uh, quest weeks are few and far between these days, and we got to cherish them when they come around. Uh, Tannis, you're here as you are each and every week. Welcome back. Thank you, Shane. You can be found in game at Tannis79. And Diana, you're here as well. Uh, you've been doing quest weeks with us for a while now, and uh, I'm so pleased to have you back, especially for this one. Hi, thank you very much for having me back on again. And you can find her uh, on RS at... Diana, I believe it is. I don't know if you have an underscore in RS or not. I, I uh, it is, yes, die underscore anima. There we go. Thank you so much. And of course, for everybody else listening, uh, this is going to be the quest. I mean, the podcast episode. Yes, of course, this might very well be a quest too, but this is going to be the podcast episode where we talk about the new quest, Desperate Measures. So I'm just going to get this out of the way here right at the beginning uh spoiler warning for pretty much this entire show including the update section and the question segment as well as we uh have many things to discuss on this quest and it's only come out a few days back so it's going to be something um that is going to be very spoilerish so if you don't want to hear that uh, maybe delay this episode until you've done the quest or you know if you like me and you don't care about spoilers just uh push on straight ahead so, um, let's just uh, dive right into the quest, I think. Desperate Measures, because this is um, obviously falling from desperate times. And, you know, desperate times call for desperate measures, yada, yada, yada. Um, and, I, and I think my question out of all this before we uh, get going, and I, I'm sure the measure will come into this at some point, but... Um, just a quick quick take here on this quest. Did we really do anything that you guys would classify as being desperate measures in this quest? Oh, I'd say yes. All right. Very much so. Very much so. Tennis? I mean, I don't know. I guess. I don't know. We kind of pulled a Thanos on Thanos, I, I guess. I that's desperate, right? Like, yeah. That's pretty dramatic. Yeah. yeah. That counts. All right. So starting off, of course, um, some requirements for this. You need to have completed desperate times. You also need 50 archaeology and 50 agility. And level 75 combat is recommended as there's a bit of a boss fight in the end of this, but it's a relatively simple uh, boss fight. So let's just dive right into the very beginning and you know we were we were wondering where this would uh start off of course you start off by talking with Saren and with who has her council still established north of the Berthorpe lodestone in that little house and y you update her on what exactly has been going on since the ends of uh desperate times or sorry yeah, desperate times. I'm going to mess these up at some point. So if I start yeah, messing sorry, up, I'm, probably, I'm going to follow up. But desperate times has been and gone. Desperate measures is the one we're starting. Yeah, see, and that's what I said. I'm going to mess these up at some point in the show. So if that happens, just please correct me on this. Um, so one thing I want to, I just want to say before we uh, begin on this, and you know, it was kind of alluded to in the end of desperate times, and it was definitely shown in the trailer for desperate measures, but we did ultimately get lore in game confirmation that the island that uh Carapac was flying off to at the end of Desperate Times was indeed Anachronia. And it's going to begin there. Um 
Diana, do you uh, want to jump in at this point, or should I just uh, keep moving us through here uh, until we get to the island itself? Um, well, tennis. Tennis. Um, uh, I'm sorry, Shane. You confused me. We're starting with Saren, right? Yeah, we are. Okay. Yeah. So you start off by uh, basically where desperate times started. Everyone's been gathered together in this room to try and decide what to do about the threat of the Elder Gods. So that's still the big question that's unresolved since the end of Endgame. Um, and yeah, Desperate Times, we tried to do something. It didn't work. It ended up with Karapak stealing the needle and taking it off to this mysterious land, Orthon. And at that point, I think this was in May of last year, yep. we knew nothing about Anachronia, the land out of time, anything. That all came much, much later. Yeah. Um, but yeah, now now we have some more context. We do know that he, the Orthon, is on Anachronia, and that's where we're heading next. Yeah. Um, and, 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 you know, and about Saren's council here uh, is that she starts to get worried that everyone's still bickering, obviously, and everyone's still arguing because you've got every single faction in RuneScape represented here, and none of them have ever got on. Um, but they're all starting to come around to Saren's point of view, kind of against their will. <laughs> Yeah, and this is uh, something Saren's aware of, and it's parallel to Zaros' power of control. Like, people who are in Zaros' presence for a while, they just find themselves kind of wanting to do as he says. He's got this really powerful charisma. And she's got something similar, where if you spend enough time in Saren's presence, you become infatuated with her, and you want to do what she says. It's exactly the same thing, but in a slightly different aspect. And um, that's what she thinks is happening. Like, people are starting to agree with her, kind of without thinking about it, and she doesn't want that to happen. Why wouldn't she want that to happen? I mean, I would if I was involved in that. So she says that she doesn't want that to happen because she's not a mortal race. She's not okay. part of any mortal race. Right. And she wants mortal races to make the decision on this. Right. Yeah, um, and, and she, she has all the... Easily. And she has all that experience, too, from uh, when she was too attached to the owls back in the day. Yeah, she's made this mistake twice before. First with the Majorat, yeah. where she posed as Ma and gave them their rituals where they killed each other to survive, which is what we discovered at the end of Children of Mar. It was never Mar who gave that order, it was Saren. Um, and then with the elves as well, they are, the, with the, particularly with the Tarthiad elves, who are addicted to her presence. You just love um, Tarthiad, don't you, Tannis? <laughs> I do. I, I do. I think I've been there once before and died very quickly and never okay. went back. Okay, <laughs> all right, fair enough, fair enough. Um, but yeah, she's made that mistake twice before and she doesn't really want it to happen again by the looks of things. So she's kind of asking you to, we need to get the res this resolved for everyone's good. Yeah. And, and of course the world guardian is the one who's going to, um, resolve it. And, yeah, and the world guardian is immune to her, immune to her charms as it were. Yeah. And then after that, it was off to Anachronia, unless you want to discuss anything else that Saren, uh, said in the beginning there. I think the biggest thing there was her aura of control. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think that that's a concern that possibly might be built on maybe in a later quest because it's not, it wasn't addressed at any other point during this yeah. storyline. Yeah. And, but it was brought up as enough of a plot point that I think it's going to cause conflict later down the line. And, and you know, there, there's a the whole question too with that. Um, maybe at some point in the future, actually, I'll, I'll save this till the end, but maybe there needs to be something like that for the World Guardian. And we can talk about that later once uh, mm. all the aspects come into play. This has been a particularly place. juicy quest for the whole yeah. world guard yeah. concepts. Like there was a real bombshell at the end. That, yeah, ooh, and, really excited and, to get to that point. And I think that's going to form the locus of where the storyline goes in the future. And mm. and if and if we're right on that, it's going to be some very interesting narrative stuff. But anyways, yeah. off to Anachronia we go. Right. Um, yeah. Then we have that little chat with Mister Mordo. Um, he tells us that we need to go find uh, Thok and Charos uh, on by I guess where they landed. Uh, I guess that's on the east, uh, eastern or the western side of the island. I can never get my cardinal uh, directions straight in RS. But uh, we go find Thok and Charos, and you know, I, I think that these two characters, when we first met Thok in one of the Fremen quests, I forget which one it was, and then Charos and you know, we knew he existed at some point and we needed to find his human form in desperate times. And 
um, the character development that happened in You Are It was obviously building up to a point here um, where he would be able to uh, help us in this endeavor. And, you know, I, I'm getting ahead of myself, but quite frankly, without Charles, we wouldn't have been able uh, to do this. But we find them um, just kind of by the um, – below the first agility obstacle, I'll say, there. Yeah, so kind of a little bit northwest of the base camp. Yeah, and, you know, it's kind of ominous because they're standing right by this door that has a huge dragonkin statue on it. So it's almost as though, oh. Big dragonkin statue with glowing eyes, I've just yeah. noticed. <laughs> so this is this is probably where, where Carapac is hiding inside here. Um, but we don't find out here at at the, at at the beginning that this is actually his base now, do we? We have to... No, so what happens next is basically you get a little catch-up of what Thok and uh, Karos have been up to. And this whole section was very, very funny. Oh, yes. yeah, I love this. You basically get a a version of the Fremenic sagas, which are the little dungeoneering mini-quests where you play as Thok and Marmoros going through the some dungeoneering yeah. levels. And I just want to say um, that I was devastated when I saw that we were going to have to watch one of these sagas because... Those Dungeoneering sagas that are in game right now are some of the worst aged content that the game has like for modern. No, I, I mean they're good for the lore, but I, I really don't feel as though they fit uh, in the way the modern game works, and it just feels like they've aged so horribly. Maybe I'm biased because I really like the Moya one. Okay, <laughs> I think that might have been one that came out after EOC, but the ones that came uh, out before EOC were really, really rough. But. I think this one didn't take itself seriously, yeah. so I gave it a well, not at all. This one was very, play. very silly. Yeah, it was. It's a lot more fun. I don't think it, it would have. I think it would have had the same opinion um, if it was like serious, like some of the sagas are. Um, I don't... Yeah. yeah, yeah. This one was a very, very silly little thing. It was Thok telling the story of what happened when they arrived, and you play as Thok, and it's yeah, it's just a very nice bit of humor. Um, and from, it, it, yeah, and and it from, gets and it gives the quest kind of maybe a um, PG PG thirteen rating because you, you, you did notice the part where they mentioned Thox lower appendages plural. Oh yeah, there's a few um, <laughs> a few questionable jokes. <laughs> uh, there was something like that with uh, Lanakea too, wasn't there? Yeah, by me. Uh, yeah, but Thok even just stick. the. <laughs> the examine text on some of the items around there and the dialogue and um oh, shoot the i forgot to, he does forgot to he examine like everything doing push-ups yeah and he has his own little jingle it was just it's just a very nice funny section um and actually has a little bit of a, i think a little bit of a wider meta slightly meta theme of the quest which is uh, history being told by the winners and history being told by the survivors. It's, yes. it's kind of a very light-hearted take yes. on this. And but this is going to be a theme throughout the quest. Yeah, and how what you hear about the history is always tainted by who's telling the story. Exactly, exactly. Um, and uh, I thought, oh, if they're going this direction, this is going to be very interesting because, you know, first we're kind of not taking it seriously here in the Thok versus Charles kind of thing, and then Charles corrects himself. And, you know, for anybody who's heard me tell a story before, you'll know that I like to exaggerate. Probably not as much as Thok, but nonetheless, um, I, I realized that something, oh, this is something that I do, and maybe... Uh, this is uh, this is a lens into you know history written by the victors as it as it would be, and this saga tells their entire story from the boat crash uh, where they landed all the way moving their way up to base camp. And can I get to the really juicy part yet? I just uh, want to know if either one of you heard like when Charles talks, do you hear like a really pretentious English accent? Absolutely. Okay. Thank Absolutely. You. <laughs> I, I, um, Tom Hiddleston voice. Yeah. That, that's the voice I've given him. Um, uh, yeah, I love Karas. He's such a great character. Yeah, um, I, sh I should have yeah. listened, listened to the voice acting that happened in uh, Clan Quest Discord because apparently we had voice acting in this quest for Thok and Charos from various Clan Quest Oh, members. yeah. So Clan Quest did a, a playthrough um, of the entire thing with about five or six people streaming it. Yep. And they did voice acting all the way through. <laughs> I still got to watch the VOD, but 
Um, I'm going to try and go through that and get some highlights for that, and then we'll put it up on the YouTube channel. Yeah, that would be great. Okay. Now I'll I even crash the screen for a bit as well. I, 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 I got to get get to this big big reveal here uh, on here because Mr. Mordo alluded to this that you know something wasn't right with this island when you watch the Anachronia cutscene when you first arrive on the island and then when you actually get here and you go through the saga you see Charles talking about it. And he said that Karapak has used the needle to pull this island into the present. He describes the island as a temporal anomaly. So yeah. what, what he says, he describes that when he was Reldo, the librarian, he heard stories about the island, but as a fossil island, which is what old school have, obviously. Um, so all the wildlife he's seeing here, all the dinosaurs, shouldn't be alive. Yeah. yeah. So his theory is that Karapak's used the needle to bring the island forward in time if that makes sense he's gone back in time found a point where the dragonkin are no longer there but the dinosaurs haven't died out and brought that to the present yeah so and, Jane, you're right <laughs> yeah I, I mean i was about a third right because my other thing was is that he would try and use the mirror to duplicate the city of orthon which you know wasn't alluded to that uh he would have been able to do that. And it, it was my assumption when I made that theory last week is that you would need the needle t- to pull it through time, but you would also need the mirror to duplicate the matter. But apparently he was just, he just pulled the entire Island as it was through, through time with no duplication. Hence the mirror not being uh, needed on that front because that was another one of the elder artifacts. So I'm, I'm only going to give myself a third of the credit for uh, my theory, because uh, the needle part was right, and stopping Carapac obviously uh, was uh, inferred by the name of the quest. So I can't give myself the, the extra points on that. Um, You're close, though. You're close. Yeah, close. And you know, I, the, the, I think that's just a good inductive reasoning or deductive mm-hmm. reasoning on there. Um, then we, of course, follow through their base camp uh their journey to the base camp um anything else on the saga before we move on because i I think we got the two biggest bits of um you know the humor aspect of it and seeing stories slash history told uh through the winner's eye plus the needle yeah so basically what you do the the, the whole point of this saga i think is just to bring the player up to speed and then so it establishes that lanya kay is involved she gets a little bit of an appearance and then you get a little bit of a confrontation with Karapak. Um, I think it's the first time we see him fly with his new model. Um, and it looks really, the animation right. he had was really smooth and yeah. really good. I, I, I spent months just watching that. I did notice that. Fantastic. I was like, boy, this doesn't look like the Karapak that we have seen in the past. It looks pretty damn yeah. good. So we, we saw him, we saw Dragonkin fly in Richard of the Marjorat. And we've seen, obviously, his new model, but we've never seen his new model actually fly, and I think it, it looks fantastic. Yeah. And, of course, Richard Lamajarov was a long, long time ago. Mm, very old model for the Dragonkin there. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, that's really all that happens in the saga. Yeah. Um, and If you want to take it from there. Yeah, and, you know, I'll, I'll just say at that point that um, I was hooked at the quest, or hooked in the quest uh, through this in terms of witnessing it from... This perspective, because any time that a theory like that with the needle is right, it, it just it just inferred so much extra on this that the needle is actually way more powerful than we thought it was, and we'll learn more about that as we uh, go through the quest. Anyways, I want to uh, say okay, go sorry ahead. about the 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 tone switching that's happening in this quest. Oh, sh- so, sure. Yeah, it starts off quite serious. Desperate times ended very seriously. Like there's a huge problem. And then suddenly you get this little injection of humor. And this happens quite a lot in RuneScape quests. There's a bit of flip-flopping around between what tone they have. And sometimes it doesn't work. Um, I think the best example I can think of at the moment is Curse of the Black Stone, which was awful for this. It's the reason I didn't like that quest is because it couldn't decide what story it was trying to tell. It couldn't decide what tone it wanted to set. And in this one, it works slightly better for some reason. I can't, I haven't really quit my finger on why, but... Did you feel the echoes of Mod Raven? 
I possibly because there are fewer writers in this quest. I know Curse yeah. of the Blackstone had yeah. several writers and several content developers working on it, and they each did a different section, which is probably why it didn't quite gel. Yeah, but, whereas this was just Mod Raven and Shrew with a little bit of help from Orion and somebody else. Rolly. Rolly there but you go. I, I think the difference was the strength of the characters in Desperate Measures. Like, I think you're right, actually, yeah. Like the 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 character, I, I have to say that the, all the char- the character cast is quite concise and quite small, but they're all very strongly drawn, and it fits, I think, to have this tone switching between them. Um, but yeah, I've been thinking about it a lot. So why does it work this time? And it didn't work last time. But yeah, possibly they're, to do with the characters and the, the general consistency is stronger as well overall. And they're kind of big enough to hold that perspective them you know on their shoulders to where mm. it wasn't as well i haven't even done blackstone but um yeah I, I just think that their 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 personalities are they're big enough that they can they can carry that home that yeah this is a surprisingly character driven quest actually thinking about it a lot of it is based on the strength of the character like the, the the narrative strength of the characters a and that's what we said we wanted that. after needle skips and you are yet Mm, mm. it's a nice direction to take in because you don't often find it in MMOs. Yeah. All right. Um, So after that, you wind up back at the entrance of what will soon become revealed as Carapax hideout. And at at that point you talk with Charles in the present and he says, have I mentioned that I hate time travel? (laughs) Which I absolutely enjoyed that line. Um, Following from that, uh, as you progress through the dialogue, he says that this is indeed Carapax base and there are some archaeolo- archaeological um, sites that you can excavate here to learn more about uh, the Dragonkin and what exactly is happening on the island. And they're standing uh, right next to you there, the two little uh, archaeology excavation hotspots. And this is where you need the 50 archaeology requirement you excavate both of those um you'll need um 100 orthon glass in order to restore both of them both the dragonkin device and the dragonkin tablet and you know when you show him this he's like yeah i don't know what this does you know you're the archaeologist go and go and restore it and then bring it back to me <laughs> yeah, that's quite sassy i really like i really like that oh well, yeah i mean that that's a tone that i got from that um, mm-hmm. now from what I got from this is that we really didn't know what these artifacts did at this point because he just basically said, hold on to them after you uh, restore them. Right. Yes. Well, for the, for the first device, it has a quite an interesting little, uh, bit of examine text. Oh, shit, um, I didn't look at that either. Oh, not the examine text. When you restore an archeological, uh, when you restore an archaeology artifact, you can look at it and it'll give you a little pop-up and give you a couple of lines of flavor text right. about it. And for the Dragonkin device, I'm going to stall for a second while I find the the thing. Yeah, and, and see, this is the thing we should have uh, we should have pulled this together before we began. Uh, let's see, where are you here? Now... Got it. Okay. Uh, so got- the Dragonkin device is like a little purple... D20 almost. And okay, that's what it, that's why I look for. The rhythmic thrum it gives off is relaxing and it's multifaceted shape hypnotic. Extensive study of it caused observers to fall into a deep sleep and have vivid dreams. So that's your first clue to something important that comes up later. Oh. And it's a very intriguing okay. couple of notes. Like, okay, was where's this leading? Right. And then similarly for the second thing you dig up, which is the tablet, tablet the Dragonkin tablet. The uh, stone tablet appears akin to those discovered from other areas, but much older. Strange going glyphs have been seen to appear on it, floating above the tablet's l- surface. So it's this weird thing, and you can't read it. Okay, so what this is it. what this is referring to is um, what we see in both memories. Of course, the first one refers to the sleeping dragonkin, which we'll get to, and then the second one is the symbols that we need to um, cycle through to unlock. Uh, or power down that portal, I guess. 
I think they're related, yeah. Yeah. Um, so what you do is you take the tablet to Karos and he says, I don't know what this says, but I know someone who might. Dun, dun, and dun. my favorite character comes in. It's Hannibus. Yeah, the resident expert on Dragonkin uh, who is alive and sane and doesn't want to destroy anything. Yeah, Hannibus, the Ilyunka, the, the dragon rider who we met in one of a kind. Yes. He's found at uh, Ranch Out of Time uh, by our favorite NPC, prehistoric Potterington. This sequence with Hanavus is the sweetest thing. And again, tone flip flop on the Oh, yeah, he flirts with <laughs> Granny Potterington. <laughs> or Granny Potterington flirts with him, which is hilarious. Yeah, and, uh, and I just got to point out for anybody who did this quest at that point and didn't go into the Mod Raven voice for Granny Potterington or Prehistoric. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing it wrong if you don't use the Mod Raven voice. <laughs> God, I remember him at RuneFest. Yeah. Anyhow. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, it, it's times like that you wish that this was voiced. Yeah. Uh, could you imagine if they had him voicing Granny or prehistoric Potterington? Be perfect, wouldn't it? Yeah. Absolutely perfect. Um, but, yeah, again, with the, the changing tone, we've gone from serious to humor to a very sweet and heartfelt little section, a bit of character development for Hannibus. Yeah. Um, it's, it's not... It's not uh, compulsory you can just skip through it immediately give him the tablet and move the quest on but you can also talk to him and ask what's he doing on gillen or what why is he at the farm uh and it turns out he's kind of settled there like he's raising farm animals and he's got a bit of arable land and he's got a cave somewhere on the island that he's made a yeah, home in. and i mean dragonkin dragonkin city orthon at some point which makes sense um what about Vindicta? He out that Hannibus isn't Dragonkin. Oh, he's a dragon. Yeah, he's from a different right. world. Okay. Right. He's a very, he's a dragon rider. I think you say Ilyunka. They're from a world right. called Aya. Right. Okay. I, um, and these are. I forgot that point. So yeah, his daughter is Vindicta, who is the rider of Gorvek in God Wars Dungeon Two. Um, and Hannibus's dragon is the King Black Dragon. Okay. And, yeah. Yes, and you know this is this is some another piece of feedback I heard from the Clan Quest community is they want a Hannibus Vindicta quest. I would yes. love yes. Hannibus Vindicta mini quest because yes. they they Please. Hannibus said that he's trying to uh, he's trying to bond with his daughter basically, and his daughter was being raised by Gorvek. Yeah. Because um, at this point, when she was born or when she hatched, Hannibus had been turned to stone by an Akra. And is kind of trapped somewhere. I forget exactly where, but you free him at the start of one of a kind. And he didn't even know he had a daughter until Curse of the Black Stone. And that's when they met for the first time. Right. And that was um, the huge reveal of that quest. That was the big, that was my favorite part of that quest. Like I know I said I didn't like it overall, but that they had a really lovely moment together. Quite a sad one, really, because of how Vindicta's been raised. Like she's this really violent, angry weapon of Zaros, and that is just so not the dragon right away. They are very gentle people. Yeah. And it's very in tune with nature. And I appreciated hearing about this in this quest because, I mean, it, it doesn't necessarily, you know, fill out the lore for desperate measures, but it, it helps just, you know, saying, hey, this is this character. He's been up to this since um, you would have seen him last. And, you know, of course, it, it's not required that you have done Curse of the Blackstone, so it's just a extra little cherry on the top for people who have done it and are aware of that. Mm. It, it's probably my favorite bit of character development. Yeah. Um, and I was saying in the pre-show that when I was reading through this and saying, he said, oh, he's got his cave, he's got his arable land, he's happy, he's settled, he's bonding with his daughter. I got really scared that they were going to kill him off because yeah. that's the kind yeah. of move... Raven would make. Yeah, and, and you, you're not the only one who thought that. Yeah, um, I was genuinely worried that we were going to lose him. <laughs> I, I, I thought, you know, coming in it would be Thok. But, you know, as we started getting more of this focus on Hannibus, I thought, oh, okay. Um, yeah. We'll see. It, it would be particularly sad because Carapac has helped Hannibus in the past. Again, back to one of a kind. Um, Carapac offered to help the Dragon Riders because they're going extinct. They're dying out and they don't know why. Yeah. Karapak offered to lend his help to the scientist to say, well, I can probably help you. So they have had some interactions in the past and it's been a positive interaction. 
or relatively positive, depending on how you look at it, that the yeah. details are a bit unethical, perhaps. But he did offer to help. So I thought, is Karapat going to kill him? Oh, I would have been so upset. But luckily, spoiler alert, that didn't happen. <laughs> yeah. And, and our whole reason uh, for going to Hannibus was to, of course, find information and with that get a translation of the Dragonkin tablet. Mm, yeah. And this then pointed us to uh, the northern part of Anachronia, one of the two areas of the island after it first came out. And I go back to the first roundtable we had after Anachronia launched – where I was very doubtful that the next skill would be archaeology, but this one site and then the one to the east of it, uh, also on the northern tip, really solidified that archaeology was going to be coming into the game. And the one, of course, we're going to is on the uh, northwestern tip of the island. And, you know, you got to give them credit. Northeastern? Be- Northeastern? Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's all right we'll do it yeah yeah and you know it's just my map directions always getting messed up but anyways north northeastern part of it and for anybody who has explored the island in depth before this quest you'll note that this that these structures and these doors were actually there back then and you could click on them and nothing would happen with them when uh anachronia first launched so there was intent to do something with these at some point, and here we have it in the quest. Um, I don't know if I should ask this question now or if I should ask this question later, um, but is this place we're going to on the uh, northeastern tip with the dragon can and the next puzzle in the quest here? Is that where the Orthon dig site's going to be? If I reckon sure Orthon. Orthon. I think Orthon is kind of all over the place, if that makes sense. Okay. Um, at some point during the quest, I think it's slightly later on, uh, Karapak refers to the base camp as one part of the city. Interesting. So I believe perhaps the city is the covered the whole island. I'm not sure, though. Could you imagine needing to use the agility course to get around for archaeology? On I'd this? rather not, but... <laughs> it might be a bit like Everlight in that there's um, yeah. kind of each area has a certain concentration okay. of archaeology. All right, so I imagine enough. that might be how it is. Fair enough. Anyways, head to the uh, head to the north uh, northeastern part of the island there. And, you know, uh, getting there as per usual in Anachronia style, you take the agility course a bit and then you gotta uh figure out which paths are indeed walkable and then uh work your way up but, but of course this is not the anachronia complaints episode this is a episode of course about i didn't use desperate measures course. oh you didn't I never, no i never used to all right course. diana do you use the agility the course to get around area. the kind of use a mix of agility and just walking around but yeah. i don't mind walking around anachronia okay fair enough i think it's a very nice environment and very interesting looking environment yeah um and, and so i quite like just wandering around it like i'm never really in any rush to go anywhere right. so i just kind of wonder you know another fun thing about this is that you get to see all the various landscapes like you know in the northern part here it's very sandy but in the uh southern parts it's more jungly which i yeah, which... got distinct biomes which are quite nice things just to look around and have yeah. a poke around and which yeah. you wonder if that's going to uh, factor into it at all. But nonetheless, uh, you progress to this uh, northern area here and you um, find Hannibus there. Um, and th- these are runes. And, you know, I thought at this point that we were actually uh, maybe going to have a confrontation with Carapac because the way this is all built up in this structure, it's like it's a series of stairs that are of course going up to some point and then when you get to the top maybe there's going to be this huge cutscene where Karapak would appear and something dastardly would happen like the point where he might kill Hannibus off or something to that effect but you know nonetheless uh, none of that none of that did happen and then when we're at the top of the uh, runes there we talk with Hannibus and he says oh Maybe you could use this Dragonkin device that you have in your inventory and you can open up this door. And then we open up the door 
And then we get into this area that was built entirely for this quest. And this is why I asked if this is if if the dig site was going to be up here. Because this entire room, and if you look to the back of it, there's rocks and a rock slide. It looks like this is prime area to excavate and dive deeper into the future of the Orthon dig site. So that's why oh, I, so. I feel that this might be part of the Orthon dig site down here. Yeah, that, I hope that we was get my to dig theory. around in here. Well, you do. It's have got to the same kind of. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, it's got it's got the same kind of feel as the archaeology sites in terms of environment and yes. atmosphere and scale. So I, I'd really like them to feature it again. Yeah. Um, and if they don't, I'd be very surprised because this is a huge bespoke piece of, you know, content. If it's just for one quest, Boy, then they don't use I it again. That's what yeah. I thought going through this. I was like, wow, there's a lot of care put into this, and it's really nice. And yeah. you know, I, one I thing I really like: I one is, one. if you walk over the metal grill in the ground, you get the whole that that lovely kind of boots on metal sound. <gasps> I did that three or four times, and I noticed just like walking across it. It's like, oh, this sounds really nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I noticed that too, actually. Mm. Um, amazing atmosphere work that they did but this is where something interesting happens because we learn that we can access a dream or a shared memory uh through hannibus of these sleeping critters in here so these uh dragonkin here are the nodon who are a third faction of dragonkin uh, we know about two already we've got the the dactyl which is what Carapac's part of, and we've got the Necrocytes. Um, and the thing with the faction of the Dragonkin, each one has their own approach, or had before the destruction of the Stone of Jazz, each one had its own approach to how to free themselves from the curse. Yeah. So the Dactyl uh, went to science, um, the Necrocytes turned to their anger, and the Nodon decided to sleep it out. And this is what Which we find Which Carapac is not a fan of. No, Carapac thinks it's, you know, just sitting back and waiting for someone else to do something about it when he's a scientist and he's going to fix it himself. Um, yeah. But yeah, that's what we see at the back here. We've got these kind of preservation pods with sleeping dragonkin in them. And what Hannibus can do is use his kind of, his empathic power, which uh, dragon riders are established to have. I think Syrian said he was a bit dissatisfied with this because it felt a bit um, kind of ghost in the machine. Like Hannibus has, suddenly has this power to, to fix it up. And it's not a sudden thing. It has been established in one of a kind that this is how they communicate with dragons. They have this empathic, near telepathic power uh, with other lizard races. So that's what he used here. And he brings both of you into a dream space. Um, yeah, and we can go from there. And in this dream space, you are able to actually watch what the node in dragonkin did prior to going to sleep and there's two different phases of this the first one in the top room that we're in when we watch this you see these dragonkin and you know you're told that you know hey just remain in an objective mode and don't necessarily interact with them because if you do that there's a chance that you'll you know be able to actually interfere in their dream and they would wake up and that and that wouldn't necessarily be be a good thing to happen in this case, but more on that when we get to the second uh, bit of the memory. And, you know, there's actually a really fun thing that I uh, pointed out and be interesting to see if you picked up on this, Tannis, is that when you're actually inside the dream, um, the atmosphere of the room changes. The lighting gets this yeah, little bit more contrast. Did you pick that up? I can't say that I did. Okay. If you go outside in the dream space as well, the sky is turned this really bright, toxic yellow. It looks so good. <laughs> yeah. And I, I was wondering if we were going to see that, but more on that later. Um, let me get to the rewards on this. But uh, in terms of uh, what you have to do on this in this first phase, you, you watch the node in Dragonkin as they're progressing around their room here. Then they get to this uh, pylon object on the southwest tip of the room, and it has this 
symbol on it. And, you know, you need to take note of this symbol. And when this was happening, I have a question for the both of you. Did you both um, take note of the symbol or did you just, you know, kind of not necessarily take too much note of it? Because I was thinking I was going to need to remember what each specific symbol was. But in reality, when I got out of the dream, I only needed to click the pylon twice and it was set into the state that it needed to be set in. Green show of it. Okay. And so, use that as my reference point. So did I just get lucky then that I only needed to click I it twice? Did. I think it took me a bit longer to fix it unless I did okay. it wrong. Okay. I can't remember exactly. I used a screenshot just to make sure. I yeah, because, right. you know, object outlining is actually key here because you can use that to tell which part of the glyph you're clicking on the left or the right one. Um, but well, you I, can click on different parts of it. Yeah, that's the sense that I got. Oh, of course you can. There's three symbols, yeah. aren't there? The- yeah, except you can't change the middle one. The middle one is set. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So I think the point of this part was to introduce... Uh, the me- the mechanics of a bigger puzzle later on. Yeah, the, the dragonkin pylon. How it works. Now these dragonkin symbols here, um, when they set them, and you know, you take a screenshot of it, and I, I did the same thing, but I realized that oh, maybe I didn't need to do that, and I guess I just got lucky because when I got out of the dream, I just had to click it once, and it was set the way it had to be to deactivate the pylon, so maybe that was dumb luck on my part. Um, But do we have any idea what these symbols mean? Or should we talk about that later in the grand scheme of things? (laughs) Uh, Let's talk about We will. (laughs) Okay. So after this, you go outside, and then... uh, You have to go to the uh, other opposite side of the runes there. And with that, um, you enter into another shared memory uh, state. And this time, when you're out there, rather than needing to remember the way a specific device was set, um, all you have to do is remember a code word. With. And you get quite a handy little hint telling you, oh, I should remember what that word yeah, is. <laughs> hey, this is gonna be this is gonna be important. This is how you're gonna uh get into the into the room via passcode. And it goes in, your, uh, goes in your chat. Oh it did? Yep. Okay, neat. Uh Hepin Kara um I I have no idea if I'm saying that right. But um in observing this you'll enter that and then you'll be able to uh, see the lower chamber of these ruins. And once again, another huge area that was built and has only been used for this quest. And it would be fun to see this again for the Orthon Dig site, which we know is in development at this point. So maybe, right? Maybe. Maybe. Um, I, I think after this, another it's that other uh, dream sequence that begins with, I think it was called the Kindred Council, right? This is this is where we get a really interesting dollop of Dragonkin lore. Yeah, um, you go back further in time to before I things think, went bad. Before things, well, kind of after things went bad. So my impression was that this was after the Dragonkin had arrived on Gilinor, obviously. So their universe has been destroyed. I think quick recap of the overarching story of Dragonkin: they are from the previous revision. Yep. And yeah. revisions are, you know, iterations of the universe that the Elder Gods create. They go to sleep, and then when it's time for them to be born again, they eat the universe, they eat the anna of the universe, in doing so destroy it and create a new one. And the Dragonkin are survivors and remnants of the previous revision. They hid in the abyss as the revision was taking place, and the abyss is this weird space between worlds that are still entirely short. It's how we teleport, we travel through the abyss. Yeah. Um, and then when the new revision was formed, they came to Gilinor and they settled here. And what they're trying to do in this council sequence is they're trying to decide how to protect themselves from the Elder Gods, how to prevent what happened to them happening again. Their entire universe was destroyed. Obviously, they're going to want that to not happen again. And they're kind of debating. They've split into four factions. And they're yeah, debating this how they're is the time when we learn about the fourth faction, the, the Agra. The Agra, yeah. Um, and the necrosites were just known as the sites at this stage. They yeah, and, um, and coming into this quest, we only know it knew of two, right? 
the dactyl and the necrocytes. Yeah, yeah. dactyl and necrocytes, and we learn of the the node and and agra, and yeah. we we really don't pick much about pick much up about the agra here, do we? No, they don't get much of a mention. Um, I was been trying to pin down just exactly when this happened, and it's kind of I don't know whether it's pre first age or first age, but a very very long time ago. Um, before Guthics arrived, before many of the other sentient races arrived. Yeah, yeah, definitely. This is really ancient history. And, you know, I, I think the interesting part about this is that you could see the tension um, between them. And they operate in pairs in that there's the leader and then the fledgling in this council meeting. There's a leader of each faction and then there's a fledgling as well as in somebody who um is kind of there as a, i guess a viceroy or backup uh to the leader of that faction in the council meeting which which is another aspect i found interesting because this is a whole culture that we really uh haven't been introduced to before uh aside yeah, this from is, this is all completely kind. new yeah um i think again nodding to how old this is carapac is a fledgling exactly in this scene and um, then we but have it to also ask, how ties did we get to the that point? What was that? How do we get to that point where Carapac is this grand ringleader? Hmm. So. Um, and it's, it kind of ties in again to what was mentioned in a really lighthearted manner in Thok's saga. But the scene we see is told from the perspective of the Nodon. Right. Who may very well be because unreliable their, narrators. Because we're in their dream. We're in their dream. Yes, and, and that's so, the key point. It's a perspective. Anubis actually mentions it, and Anubis yeah. actually says it, which means it's going to be important. And it's a question of perspective in terms of how everybody views what is going on in the world. Mm. And I think the way the Noden are viewing things is a very Guthixian way. What do you mean by that? Well, it's it's not you know we're gonna you know completely destroy this curse and we're gonna break it and then we're gonna you know find a way. They weren't to... cursed at this stage. Oh, they weren't. They weren't cursed at this stage. Okay. What they were trying to do at this stage is prevent anything from happening to them. And I still stand by what I said about it being a very Guthixian manner, is because. And maybe it's just presented to us this way in the dream, but it seems as though the Noden are taking the most most balanced approach. They seem to be the most measured, yeah, don't they? Yeah, exactly. Um, but again, it's from their perspective. So it could very well so, be that perspective, because I think, I think yeah. we all consider ourselves as measured when we look at it that way. They could very well see themselves as the ones taking the best path. Yeah. And Karapak sees himself as taking their best path. So, bias of the storyteller. I'd love to experience more of this era of history. It sounds really interesting, doesn't it? Kind of yeah. prehistory. Um, Hopefully the Orthon Dig site can do that. Maybe, yeah. Uh, but the really interesting part of this sequence is kind of what happens after. So the, the, the council sequence comes to an end and Hannibus tries to take you on to another part of history, but you get interrupted because the Nodon notice you the dreaming nodon kind of turn and look at you, which is quite, quite disconcerting. Um, they're not supposed to be able to do that. They're not supposed to be able to see you. Um, but then you explain to them why you're there in their dream. And they tell you a little story. You get a cutscene, you get some voice acting, you get a story of what Karapak did, what his device is and what it's going to do. Yeah. Um, Karapak's method of wanting to remove the threat of the Elder Gods was to make the Dragonkin as powerful as they were and kind of stand alongside them so they wouldn't then get destroyed. So what he did is he created this device that generated something called Shadow Anima. And everyone note that down because yeah, that is super that. important. <laughs> this is the biggest bombshell of this quest is Shadow Anima. Um and it's a, a power source analogous to the natural anima of the universe that's on Gilinor, but it leads to corruption instead of natural anima kind of creates life and stems from life in a simultaneous way. It kind of is the source of life and it is made by life. 
this is like an antimatter almost, and it's just corruption. So what he wanted to do was flood Gilinor with corruption and create this infinite source of power to rival the Elder Gods. So that's the second and, group we know that wanted to become like the Elder Gods. Now we have the Dragon yeah, maybe King, not of course, to ascend Zaros strictly. To. Yeah, maybe well, not to I mean, ascend strictly, be, but to, if you but to muscle them out and say, you can't mess with us anymore. You can't mm. hurt us anymore. But it failed. Jas found out, and she was mad. <laughs> she destroyed the Dragonkin civilization, and this is when she cursed them. She, it was due to Kerapak's actions that she bound them to the Stone of Jas and left them with this curse where every time someone tried to use the power of the Stone of Jas to do anything, it would hurt the Dragonkin. It would cause them agony until they killed the false user. And that's been their driving force ever since. Yeah, and, and we knew about the curse, but we didn't know exactly what caused her to put that curse onto them. And here we have yeah, it. We didn't know it was Karapak. Yeah. And it kind of gives a whole new meaning to his drive for freedom. Yeah. Because it's his fault. And, you know, at this point, I was kind of done with him. And as a, and I, and I don't mean like literally done with him as a character, but my sympathy for him was gone at this point. His... Arrogance and his hubris were starting to come to the fore. Yes, here. exactly. And this is something I kind of want to talk about a bit at the end, how it's quite an unusual theme to explore um, this kind of hubris in, in modern fantasy storytelling. It's quite common in older stories and kind of uh, uh, fables and that kind of mythological storytelling that's meant to have a moral behind them. But in, in more modern Western fantasy storytelling, it's more unusual and kind of struck me as a quite an interesting path to take with Karapak and with the path of an antagonist. Yeah, I really appreciated I it. Yeah, I don't want to call Karapak a villain. Thought did. I don't think he is. I think he's an antagonist. There's a, there is a difference, and I can go into that more later. Thought if you did, want. and he said villain, and he starts attacking him. Of course, with this he did. Snake, and Charles <laughs> joins in, and you yeah. see. Okay, so basically, yeah. After we, just so you've, you've skipped a little bit there, but after you've had this dream sequence, you wake up, and you come back to the ruins, and you find Thok and Karos, and Karapak turns up and confronts you. Yeah, and you fight. And you come to the really horrible realization that Karapak has used the power of the needle to make himself invulnerable. <laughs> I remember at this point in the quest, he turned up with five million hit points or whatever the ridiculous number was. Yeah. And I just had my mattock. Like, that was all I was armed with. <laughs> and I thought, oh, I'm dead. Um, but he, didn't, he doesn't attack you. He just lets you attack him until it becomes clear that you can't damage him. He's yeah. used the time, the time travel power of the needle to just undo any damage that's done to him. And he is effectively immortal which is a big problem looking at it bit of a problem yeah <laughs> yeah uh and yeah he kind of goes off in a bit of a uh, evil villain monologue here i say i don't want to call him a villain but he goes off in a monologue here saying that he's going to turn on his device and flood gillinor with corrupted anima with shadow anima and basically put his original plan into motion and destroy gillinor yeah and, um, and we didn't know what the plan was um we knew in desperate times that he said he was going to feed the anima of Gilinor to the Elder Gods, but we didn't know exactly what that meant or how he was going to do it. And, you know, with that being revealed here, um, this furthered my idea that, you know, I personally at this point see him as a villain and I didn't have any sympathy for him with this mm. because, I mean, this is the, this is the classic double dupe, right? We're we're told in the in desperate times that he has a plan to put the elder goddess to sleep, but in the end he winds up duping us and stealing the stone. And you have to wonder what exactly that was about. But lo and behold, here you learn the full depth of the plan. And me as a person, I just I just don't like being lied to like that. So hopefully my character feels the same way. Mm. So, so I found it quite. Sorry, Diana. I just wanted to say this is where I started thinking of uh, Karapak as kind of like a Thanos type character. You know what I mean? Where it's kind of in the eye of the beholder in a way. Um, the kind of thing where one person decides that he's going to sort it all out. Exactly. Who cares what anyone else thinks? I'm going to fix this. It's the same arrogance. So, yeah, well, what Karapak's trying to do is by killing Gilinor, he, I think. 
his plan is to, by doing that, he robs the Elder Gods of their primary food source. Or I think if the Elder Gods are still on Gilinor, because they have, at this point, they have laid their eggs in various places around yep. Gilinor, and, and they are physically there, by destroying the world, he destroys them. Exactly. And, and he puts an end to the cycle of revision and creation that they are part of, and that's how they create and destroy the universe. And his so one idea. world dies, but the universe survives. Precisely. And this is at the point, I believe it was Charles that said, hey, we could do an evacuation through the world gate. But it was said, no, you wouldn't be able to get enough people through in time. Yeah. And Karapak has a really chilling piece of dialogue where he says the mercy. Uh, let me scroll down to it quickly. Which one are you uh, thinking of in particular? Uh, he says, hang on. All right, fair enough. Sorry, no, no, never mind. I'm just trying to find it. Um, yeah, that's da, fine. Da, da, da. I, I think this entire part... So, oh, yeah, oh. I've just found it. Sorry. Okay. So I offer you this gift in the absence of hope. Know that you cannot stop me. So you do not waste your final moments and fruitless attempts to thwart me. Go spend time with your loved ones, friends and family. Celebrate your lives together. Bury all grievances and prepare yourself for the afterlife. Oof! <laughs> where, the mercy where, I, he gives is time to set your time, it's time to set your affairs in order before he kills yeah, you. Yeah, that was a, that was very ominous. I'm trying to remember where we. I, f I feel like we heard some kind of similar sentiment to that before in game. From Probably from Carapac, to be honest. <laughs> um, he has a fantastic monologue there. Um, I think Raven had a lot of fun. I wish that could have been voiced. Piece. Oh, it would have been fantastic voiced, wouldn't it? Yeah. But yeah, alas. Okay. All right. Um, and, you know, at, at this point, it's like, oh, crap. What do we do now? We know what his whole plan is. We don't have a way to stop him. He's invulnerable. What do we do? Um, and you know, if they wanted to, they could have split this up and said to be continued if they wanted to do the cliffhanger. Kind oh, of that stuff. would have been, they didn't. it's too oh. big of a cliffhanger. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we would have had to wait for, I mean, it's not like we're just waiting a month. I mean, we would have yeah. been waiting. The, the, it's yeah. So the, the implication here is that Carapax may be giving you a day, a couple of days to set your affairs in order before he destroys everything. So ending it on a cliffhanger would just be drawing out a little bit too much. Yeah, and, um, and I mainly said that as a, as a way of, um, you know, just being evil to people, but <laughs> I'm glad that we got but to this continue But this is very much the, the crunch point of the story, like in the, in, a, in, a, in an archetypal quest structure. This is the first defeat where your hero falls down in the face. Like the first time they try to face the evil, they fall down and they fail. And it's kind of at the beginning of the third act, as it were. Yeah, and, kind of feel like a classic story and of course, and of course, who do we look to in this point? At this point, we return back to Saren and update her on what exactly has been happening with this to see if she has any ideas. Because, of course, um, aside from Zara, she is one of the entities that has been around the longest and probably has some ideas about what exactly is going on at yeah. this point. And she is the direct creation slash daughter of an elder god. Yeah. So be able to um, if anyone some, knows what happened, she might be able to. Be able to provide some influence there on that. And, you know, her answer to this is to go talk to the Needle's previous guardian. When we ask her, what should, what should we do about this? And because, you know, none of the other people on the council have experience with the Needle. And as a result, we do by doing that wonderful quest known as the needle skips. And I think the needle skips is only required as an option to desperate times, right? I think it was the only compulsory quest. Let me have I think a you needed to have done needle skips, but because needle skips was, uh, it doesn't have any requirements. Yeah. Um, um, I think that's how it works. No, there's no request really? requirements for desperate times. Oh, okay. I yeah. thought it was a compulsory one, but nope. obviously not. Absolutely not. They recommend Sliske's Endgame, but yeah, nothing well, that's else, a difficult one. <laughs> yeah, but nothing else is required for it. So, yeah. and this is another point of story enrichment here because if you've done the needle skips, you absolutely know 
what the needle is capable of in terms of the whole Gail Primrose relationship with uh, the story that was there. And, oh, that was, you know, going back to that, that was such a good quest here at this point. I've still not over how good that quest was. Still yeah. not over it. Yeah. Um, I'm a little, this is one of my slight annoyances with this quest. Um, whenever you talk to Primrose and after she tells you, uh, basically you go and talk to her and you can say, is there any way we can disconnect Carapax yes. from the needle? How does the connection work between the Guardian and the needle? And she tells you that the Guardian isn't in control of the needle. Uh, the needle has some kind of consciousness. It has some kind of awareness and it controls its Guardian. Yeah. Um, but that's all she knows. That's and from I, her and I thought that was a very interesting discussion on this. And why did that annoy you? That wasn't the part that annoyed okay. me. What annoyed me the other part was another piece of dialogue you'd ask. You'd ask her how she was. And it turns out, because I remember from the needle skips, the whole point of Primrose's story is that she is deathly ill. Yeah. And that's what drives her mother to abuse the needle's power, to lock her in a time loop so she doesn't get any more any sicker. Right. Um, and at the, now she's cured. Yeah. And Not for like me, a lot that. of the narrative heft of the needle skips was the sadness that Primrose broke out of the time loop. But I know she became Gale, but that all three of them did exist separately as well. It was quite confusing in the end, but Primrose said, look, I'd rather be ill and live out the rest of my days with my mother rather than be stuck in this loop. Right. Constantly constantly staying in the same place and that was the, the really bittersweet and quite powerful ending of and the now they pulled skips. his teeth by saying oh she's all better but the did they say she was all better yeah hmm I believe so I may have misinterpreted it okay but as for, as for, uh, again let me just have a look at the I think that'd be a good thing to look into then because if they did that that kind of you're, you're right. It completely does, you know, pull the teeth of uh, the needle skips. But I mean, isn't yeah, it, it says I you ask her how she's doing, and she says I'm healthy and I'm home. So she's all better. Could that have happened um, by breaking her free of the needle? I think that was what like that can be the, the narrative reasoning for it. Like yeah. after being connected, to the needle, it kind of cured her of her illness. But for me one of the things that made Needle Skips really good was how sad the ending was. Yeah. Yeah. And how it wasn't a happy ending. And yeah, like it, it kind of pulled the teeth of that a little bit. But again, they had to move the plot on somehow, so it's not really a big deal in the end. Uh, um, let's see. So the full dialogue is, and I just looked it up, I'm healthy and I'm home. There's been a lot of difficult conversations, but we're getting through them. Mum's really been trying. She's still overly protective, but she's learned to let go. She's even let me write a letter to Sloop. He's with someone else now, but we're still friends. I don't quite know whether I'd call Carapac, or call what Carapac did to me a good thing, but it's not all bad. I do miss Gail a bit, though. Yeah. So Gale was her kind of guardian of the needle form that Carapac fought for the needle. And then when Carapac took the needle from her, Gale reverted to Primrose. Yeah. Um, and in doing so, I guess, cured her. Yeah. All right. That'd be something yeah, but that, to... that, was kind of my, that was kind of my only narrative hitch with this entire quest. Yeah. It kind of pulled the teeth. Out of the yeah, I'd ask Raven or Osborne about that. I'd be interested to see what Osborne has to say about it. Yeah, uh, that because was his be, that quest. was his quest. And he's still um, senior narrative designer, so presumably he would have had to green light what happened here. What does? Hmm? Yeah, I don't actually know what Osborne He's, head of, he's head, of, head of episodic content. So huh. anything... I was under the impression he was more like an executive role now, but um, no. maybe he does have some... Great yeah, so anything that matches, that pushes the story forward, he would have a role in. So that would be this. Yeah. Um, um, but yeah, that's kind of my... That's more of like a personal thing for sure. me like um, sure. yeah i just wanted to point it out um, but yeah after the primrose you get the thing that you you can the needle controls its guardian that's the conclusion from your conversation with her so you report that back to saren and saren says well there's not much we can do about that but she can take a risk and arrange an audience with jazz <laughs> <laughs> 
So this is the second time in the poor little world guardian's life where you have to face down the mother of creation. Yeah. <laughs> and and Jazz is awake, right? Or are we just Jazz you know? Is awake. Okay. Jazz is awake at the end of Endgame, and that um like Endgame had its flaws, but its standout moment was the reveal of Jazz. Yeah, fair enough. That was incredible. <laughs> um, um, in this audience, you're told that you need to be on your best behavior. And I'm wondering yes. what happens if you use the rude options here. If you use the rude options, um, you – hang on. I keep losing my tabs. Basically what happens is Jazz decides that human life is not worth saving and goes ahead and destroys everything. And what happens is you get then t- teleported back to Saren and told to try again. <laughs> So similar to how at the end of how at the end of Endgame, if you're rude to Jas, she just zaps you, and you have to start the little sequence again. She kills you. Okay. Um, but yeah, if you're if you're rude to Jas, she tears you apart without a second thought. All right, fair enough. Um, so yeah, be nice. Be nice to the um, yeah mother of creation. Be nice to her. <laughs> be nice to Mother Jazz. Yeah, because she will eat you otherwise. <laughs> Now this this interaction was something that I really enjoyed here. Um you know Jazz talks in uh a very uh concise way in terms of you know just answering in the very littlest form as in you know yes or no or a couple words uh here or there and the main thing that is revealed by this and you know we we heard about it before it's the shadow anima it's the something that jazz views as toxic and is toxic to the elder gods um she calls it an uh anathema it is anathema to this to this universe and our design yeah and i want to highlight that for a discussion later on yeah and and we need to remember that and you, you realize we're focusing it on shadow anima here um as if that's going to have a big impact as we um move on and you you tell jazz the problem and she's like no i can't do anything because the shadow anima is protecting carapac if if i could i would i because she's very upset of course because of the actions that he took of you know breaking the curse and whatnot on there on that front and it falls to us the world guardian of course to stop carapac and we're asked how we're going to do that, and she gives a piece of her, otherwise known as an eye of jazz, uh, which is, you know, like a fragment of an elder god that you're in possession of. And I think being such, being trusted with this is a very important part in the character development of the World Guardian. Yeah, I think it's because we are kind of the voice of the world at this stage. Yeah. Because at the yeah. end of Endgame, it was to us that Jazz addressed her concerns. And she said, I want you to prove that mortal life is worth saving. So the World Guardian is the yeah, the voice of Gilinor at this stage. Um, which is quite a heavy burden, not going to lie. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, yeah, she gives you the this eye of jazz, and it looks very, very similar to something else that's hanging around in the World Guardian's bank at the moment, called a blank observation. And it's oh. a reward given by Azanadra at the end of a sixth aid quest from quite a while ago. Uh, let me just Google it quickly. Blank observation. Um, after Heart of Stone, which is a very early sixth age. Uh, Elder God's quest. And we don't know what it is. I mean, it hasn't had a use yet. Raven said it might have a use later on. But it is the same object going by its icon as the Eye of Jazz. So I wonder what that means. Is that intentional or is that just a... It could just be reused assets. Yeah. But... I think if they wanted to reuse assets, they wouldn't use one that is well known for having a potential possible use in future and a link to the Elder Gods. So I think it's deliberate. Okay. Don't know enough. what for yet. Though. Yeah. And, and I mean, this quest is not something that's just hacked together. 
and there's lots of new assets for this quest, so it doesn't make sense that they would uh, reuse for something like that, something that is so impactful mm-hmm. on that. Um, and, you know, this is going to be used, of course, to disconnect Carapac from the needle, and then Jazz will help and, you know, do whatever she's going to do to him at the end there. So that that's what you get from your if you survive your 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 audience with Jazz, that's what you get. Um, Yay. So you talk to Saren again, and then head back to Anachronia. Yeah, and yeah, then see what... this is perhaps the most interesting mechanic of the quest: the dinosaur tower defense game. And the, what we learn when we go back and talk to our main characters right at the lodestone is that Carapac is using the power that he has of the needle to control the dinosaurs on the island and have them attack base camp and attack all the archaeologists that are around. And what you effectively do is you get put into an instance here with this where you have to do this dinosaur tower defense game. And, you know, let's, let's be real. That's what it is. And you have to survive. It is. Yeah, it is tower defense, yeah. You have um, to sur- I really enjoyed this. I yeah. thought it was a really little thing. Some people really didn't like it. I don't know what you guys thought of it. Um, I didn't think it was too bad. I mean, I, I did it twice, but I didn't think twice was too bad. Yeah, it took me three goes. Um, but I enjoyed it. I thought it was quite fun. Um, I believe this is one of Mod Shrew's first big pieces of content, like this puzzle. I think this is one of the ones he was responsible yeah. for. Yeah. This, um, like, so I, I started this quest coming off of the puzzles of Desperate Times and to do a tower defense like this with dinosaurs, one, I thought it was fun. Two, nothing felt like murder like that quest did. That was just, it's not a good experience. Yeah, and, 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 and fun harder. observation here. If you fail enough times, raising my hand, um, you're presented with an easy mode option. I'm always glad when they do easy. Anything that helps with accessibility is always good. Yeah, and and you know, I I think they need to do that for the quest, especially um, boss fights in quests. And you know, we saw that when they added in the quest armor from the quest point shop that that armor. Yeah, that set. got that got me through endgame. There that you quest go. Point armor. It's designed to, of course, make completing quests easier, and it really underscores the whole purpose of these quests is that these quests aren't designed to be you know, harrowing combat experiences where you bash your face in unless it's a puzzle, um, like Elemental Which, Workshop. It's you, just designed I mean, to allow you to progress through the story, but still take the essence away from it, hence the easy mode option. I think they kind of had an easy mode option with the puzzles this time because they didn't randomize it, thank goodness, because there was so much great story, right, that was behind this one. If they had done the same thing this time that they did last time with Desperate Times, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have finished it. There's, I couldn't have finished it. Like, even with a friend working with me, it took like an hour and a half to get through those puzzles. Like, it's well, it's probably more of an accessibility thing too. It's good to hear that that's wish, been improved. Yeah, I mean, I wish I could say it's all that, but I just don't think, I don't think that. Look. It really shouldn't matter if there's like if someone wants to use a guide or not. I mean, like to get through those things. Yeah, you should be able to get through a quest um, without a guide. And if you start having difficulties with it, it should take you into easy mode like this. So I think it was a good mechanic and good design decision that was done with this here. Yeah, I'd, I'd. I enjoyed it. Yeah, and um, it was probably how it was probably all in the placement of the. It was. It was. Guys. Yeah, and of course you're. It was to the right around. balance of kind of slightly stressful but also quite fun and satisfying at the same time. Yeah, like finishing it was actually like, oh yeah, this is really good. Like it actually felt really good to get through it. My only Which complaint is, is that the characters seemed to move kind of slow. There was that. Yeah. Um, and I couldn't – did you guys have trouble with, like, he just wouldn't hit stuff from time to time? Like, he just wouldn't swing the stick. Like, when those uh, – Oh, your player big, character. Yeah, the big Rexes would come in. Um, yeah, you know, I actually spoke to Mod uh, Camel about that briefly. Okay. And he said it's something to do with, like, 
because of these great big big dinosaurs, you have to stand in a specific area under them to right, like the be hitbox. part of to get to get the hitbox, and it's just part of the design of the of the animal. But you're right, there is some difficulty there. But one, I think it's kind of like in the bottom if you're looking down at it and it's facing off to the right kind of in the bottom left hand corner ish so if you stand under its right foot that's one of the best places to stand and um, luckily like those are that's when Hannibus really comes into play mm. like his ability yeah you know, if you can stop him you can kind of try to find a spot I just kept running yeah. back and forth because it seemed like that was the only time he was hitting him yeah. so that's what I was doing it, it was a nice little puzzle I, I, I enjoyed it yep all right. Uh, after that, uh, we uh, reconvene with Charles and uh, we start talking to him and he's done a little bit more work on the relics that we unearthed earlier in the quest. And at this point, he says that, oh, there's something involved that's called cosmic energy. And this is part of the mechanic that's going to be used in order to unlock the doors uh, to Carapax Lair. And this this is a big stretch of exposition here. Okay. And Karos, the, the the thing with the measure. Basically you get given the measure and you finally have a use for it after Fate of the Gods, where you just you've just had this elder artifact from the beginning of creation hanging around in your bank ever since. Um it kind of gives you a use for the measure. From before Picking creation. Out- it was actually from the previous revision. Well, it's one of these kind of eternal tools that the elder yeah. gods use to, to create a universe. Not very but, yeah. powerful. Yeah, um, but you use this to kind of tap into areas around the volcano so Karas can unlock the door. And in doing so, he explains more about what anima is, how it relates to magic, and how it relates to you as the world guardian. Yeah, it's all about neutralizing the cosmic harmony of the door, he calls it. And, you know, at various points around... Um, the island you use it or around the volcano uh, rather and you know he makes uh, you use it at four different spots around the volcano and he makes the point that you know nothing strange happens when it's just him things only begin to get weird and fluctuate when you the world guardian is around and then after you get to the fourth spot he says yeah there's something we should talk about here but it's better to talk about it in the company of friends and he takes us through what exactly this is and it turns out that Guthix gave us a little gift so yeah this is the i I can't really emphasize how big this reveal is yeah and and that's why Um, i'm I'm not necessarily going into it right now i'm just saying that it was Guthix's little gift but we need to preface so yeah Guthix's gift is what we were given in the world wakes and when he died, as Guthix was dying, he gave us something. And we didn't know as what a result it was. That, we didn't know what it was, but we know its effect is that gods can't harm us. We are immune from Saren's powers. We're immune from Zaras's powers. Kind of godly magic doesn't hurt us as a world guardian. And Guthix gave it to us just because if we were to stand up to the gods, which is what he wanted us to do, we needed that. But we've never really known what it is. Um, until now, <laughs> and um, it turns out Karas thinks that due to how the anima around the volcano interacts with us whenever we get close to it, he thinks that he goes into a little bit about souls, and RuneScape does a bit of inf- like exploring about what souls are, and Karas explains a bit more that they are uh, – Anima interacts with souls in a certain way, and souls can like contribute to the anima and be part of it. And yeah, so uh, magic, as you're aware, is the manipulation of anima in order to achieve fantastic results. I'm reading from his transcript here. Yeah, the manipulation of anima lets us borrow from the power set out by the elder gods in order to reorder the universe. So now we have an explanation for what magic is in RuneScape as well. Um. You remember what I said earlier when I spoke about souls, how they're containers of anima that shape the anima with our experiences. Yes. It appears that your soul is different. It looks like when Guthix made you the world guardian by giving you some of his divine power, he gave you something else. I believe the dragon king called it shadow anima. Your soul contains a carefully constructed enchantment of that shadow anima. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah. So Guthix's gift, our immunity from the gods, is a corrupt 
anti-anima. Which, That's huge. Yeah. That is but huge. One, Gothic's corrupted us. Which means... How does like, it work, though? What do you mean? Like, how does it work? How does it make us immune to the effects of the other gods? Remember what Jas said. And uh, Shadow Anima is toxic to them. Shadow Anima like is not of this stuff. universe. It's not meant to be there. It is corruption. It is death and destruction. And if they touch it, they... Almost like- so, so effectively, it's making it so that if they try and interact with us, if they try and eat us, it will be bad for them, effectively. Yes. We are toxic to this universe, literally. To its gods and its creators. Hmm. I mean, there, there's been some yeah. speculation within the lore and art community for a while of what Gothics' gift is, and whether it's a positive thing or a negative thing. And... This is big. This is quite a big revelation. <laughs> On the other hand, we were in no danger at all. I mean, we were just trying to save the world, but we would have still been here with the dragon kin. Yeah. All right. Um, so, yeah, as Kara says, the good news is that your shadow anima, your shadow soul, if I may, is repellent to the power of the gods. So that's the good news. The bad news is... What potential horrifying future could this be? We have this corruption in our soul. What's that going to do to us later down the line? I don't know. And, you know, this is where I think, and I want to talk about this in particular, I think at this point it would be absolutely genius if this confrontation was written in with the Elder Gods from the very beginning at the end of The World Wakes. And the plot in general, in general, I say, for desperate times and desperate measures was conceived of back in 2013. So priest, this guy. Yeah. Yeah. See, my problem is the corruption angle of it. Like, I wish it had just been more of like a day, night, you know, opposite yin and yang. Well, we already dealt with that uh, in uh, in the elves in the plague storyline, the Dark Lord. Is uh, the corruption side of it different to that? I feel like it, it's going to open up. Now we have we're not we're not closer to getting the story resolved, and I like to move things, you know, further because I'm always. I'm always afraid of, well, okay, well, it might be a few years before we find out what the next thing of this is, you know, like, what's the next installment? Mm. I kind of want to save a bigger discussion of this towards the end, because we did have a couple of questions come in about yeah. what is Shadow Yeah, Alma let's do that. And, in the, and I want to yeah. save my, my wider theory about what it is until then. Sure. But this is a, this is a big reveal, um, what Guthics did to us and what it might mean for us later down the line. And if, and but if, it means we can get into Carapax Lab unscathed, yeah. so that's a good thing. Which is good and important. <laughs> um, I'd also like to note that the boss fight at the end of this is a safe death, I assume, at least for us normal characters. I don't know about Iron Man. I didn't die, so I don't know. Yeah, I, didn't yeah. I didn't even have to eat. I was proud of myself. I'm like, ooh, no food. Well, and nothing. I did it with, you know, tier... I did it with tier 85 weapons dual-handed, and I wore no armor. So, And I had no food. I've, and my prayer point was half drained coming in, so I didn't have, um, I didn't have soul split. My vampirism was already on cooldown, oh, so I, I you're limping. Yeah, I, I was going in handicapped, so I died. Um, oh no! <laughs> but it is a safe death. It is a safe death. You spawn right That's outside good. the door um, of the of the lab. But yeah, so what you do now after you have this horrifying revelation, you get they said right, you can go into the lab now. Um, no one else can. It's on you. It's on your own. Go in and stop peck, stop Carapac. And yeah, you enter this really incredible environment. Oh yeah, but it's shame. Never, never mind. I'll, I'll save that. I'll save that for the end after we yeah. uh, wind up on here. Um, the book. Yeah, it's kind of relation like very similar to the archaeology sites to me in terms of size and scale and atmosphere. Yeah. Um, the music for this area, oh. for Carapax Lair, oh. is so intense. Oh, and this was the it's one. A, 
in one of the live streams they said this week this was the music track that you know could very well have been written as something as a tune that Maud Raven would do when he's about to take over the world. <laughs> yeah. It's really big and dramatic and there's electric guitars and I think it was a Mod Surma track. Yeah, Mod Surma. I say a Mod Surma is an um, EM were the, were the music guys for this one. Let me see if I can um, get but, some uh, playthrough of this uh, here for us here, of how this sounded as we progress through it. Do you want me to keep quiet for that? or? Oh, no, I don't have the right audio track selected. Never mind, it would take too long to fix. Anyways, uh, but, um, really good track. No, um, a really, really good track, kind of taking a lot of inspiration from the second Elite Dungeon. Um, so really leaning into the Dragon Kin musical themes and the, the the riffs and that kind of sound so it's all very consistent to what we know about dragon kin already um huge bespoke environment for a quest and i remember what, what, uh, earlier this month in the round table i said i was going to be writing a thing about why the golden age of runescape questing is over and blah 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 blah, blah. and my argument was that they aren't making bespoke content for quests anymore for whatever reason and this has blown my argument straight out of the water <laughs> because look at this place. And it's all made for yeah, a quest. And, I can't imagine how much time and effort went into it. It looks and, good. And I'm just going to summarize briefly here what happens next. We can go into the puzzle. Um, there's a Dragonkin tablet in uh, one of the southern, the south uh, southwestern room that you get. And you read this book and it tells you effectively which – quadrant of the lair is associated with which elder god after a certain amount of uh, inference let's just say on that but this entire lab is destroyed at the end of the quest and we'll get to exactly how that happens but just on your topic of the environment they built this entire environment only to have it destroyed in the quest yeah this is a really expensive piece of content to appear for half an hour in one quest. Yeah, especially with wow. all the graphics and the motion in the middle. Yeah, the the particle effects on the on the pylons that are whiling through all through it, like on the pipes, that glowing thing around yep. there, looked amazing. <laughs> yeah, really expensive piece of content to go in for a very short amount of time. Um, but yeah, basically what you have to do is take down the barriers by solving a little translation puzzle. There are four of these pylons that we saw earlier in the dream sequence, and each one spells out a name of an elder god in the Dragonkin language, and you basically just have to figure out which one's which. Yeah. And um, it, was I the only one who wanted you know, to see more of the Dragonkin language and you know, effectively be able to piece through what the symbols on the wall meant? Not necessarily the ones on the pylon, but just the ones on the wall inside each of the quadrants. So the ones on the wall were the names of the rooms. Okay. Um, you can, and that, that's what I used actually to translate the pillar names. Um, I kind of took screenshots of it and okay. matched up the letters. Um, and there's a couple of quite interesting, like all dragonkin vowels have the same sim symbol. Fascinating. Um, the stuff like that. Um, but that's how I actually did the puzzle. I, again, I really like this puzzle. I thought okay. it was quite really satisfying and involved so quite a lot of like, why, pen and paperwork. So that's why nice when you're dealing with the pylon puzzles, because you have Jazz, Full, Wen, and Bic, and each one of them in the middle of their name has a vowel, and it's the same symbol. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's a diamond five, or I'm sure we call it something different. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> kind of a diamond, kind of a five. <laughs> like, yeah. Um, but again, again, this was another quite satisfying puzzle. I enjoyed it. And it wasn't something that, you know, was largely trial and error based. It was all within that Carapax tablet. Yeah, you needed, you had one clue for Carapax tablet and that was all you needed. Although I have to say, trying to figure out a quite a leisurely kind of word based puzzle with that really intense music blasting in the background <laughs> was so stressful. Yeah. <laughs> I kept expecting something to start breathing down my neck any second. Um, and speaking of which, when you're looking through the, uh, the law book slash clue book slash whatever it is, you get told what the final boss is going to be. Yep. Um, kind of indirectly, but the elite dungeon two is mentioned and by its dragonkin name. It was an early and creation of that. An early creation of that. And the full name of the blackstone dragon in elite dangerous Elite, elite dangerous elite dungeon <laughs> sorry get my wires crossed uh in elite dungeon 2 her sister 
is mentioned. And she has been mentioned previously in the Elite Dungeons lore as being taken off to another location, not mentioned where. Uh, so that's the point where you realize that what you're going to face is the sister of the Blackstone oh, Dragon. Oh, so good. So good. Yeah. And when I, when I read that, I kind of had a genuine, oh God, moment, because that is a nasty fight. Yeah. <laughs> Luckily, but it's, it's not nearly as bad. Uh, 180k <laughs> life points, you don't need anti-dragon uh, protection on there. Yeah, it's, it's quite an easy quest boss fight. Um but it's very atmospheric. Yeah, just don't and step in the purple flames. Don't step in the purple flames, and she will heal herself. Yeah, um, but not not. I not absolutely much. screwed up the start of that fe- that fight so badly because context. I haven't fought anything in game since my max party last October. I haven't done any combat since then. I don't know what an action bar is anymore. So I went in completely blind and cocked it up really, really badly to start with, but managed to get through it just about. Um. But yeah, nice atmospheric quest, great music, fantastic music in the background. Um, yeah, a, a, a nice finale to this little mini dungeon you've got here. Yeah, and uh, and then after the after the dragon dies, um, you know, the entire building starts collapsing in on itself. And, but first, okay, Carapac appears. Right. Forgot about that. And this is the finale. Yeah, this is a you very don't important fight him. very important part. You think you're gonna have to fight him, but no. Um what you do is you take out the eye of jazz and you kind of release use it on its him. power on him. You release its power on him. And Jazz appears in the form of her voice, like the little sand thing that pops up whenever she speaks. And she uses Carapac's connection with the needle to bind him to the needle again, to bind him to her again in the exact same way that he was bound to the stone of jazz. So undoing everything he's worked for, bringing him right back to where he started. Yeah. And of course your character tries to reason with Carapac and you have an option. You get a choice. You get a choice to try to reason. I said he's beyond reason. And you of course wind up in the same uh, decision where you use the eye of jazz there. Um, and you know this this decision. I've heard that some people didn't like it because it you know it completely undermines everything that Carapac has done. But that's the point. Exactly. And this is what I was saying about Hobrus. Yeah. He tried to take on an elder god, and he got kicked in the teeth. He bit off way more than he could chew, and what? got punished for it. Yeah. And from I have a, I have no problem with this. He got what he deserves. See, but from a certain perspective. Is what we did any different than what he was doing? He was willing to sacrifice Gil in order to save the rest of the universe. We sacrificed Carapac and the Nodon. Yeah, that's also true. Else. Like the 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 Nodon are down here as a source of anima. Because what what else is down here in this dungeon is Carapac's device, what he's creating the anti anima or the the shadow anima, and what he's he's using the Nodon as a power source for that as a source of anima. So they're all down here and they're asleep. They have no idea what's going on. They have no part in this. Uh, but when Jas comes down here and imprisons or enslaves Karapak again, she does the same thing to the Nodon. And they're completely innocent in all of this. So Karapak brought them in. But I felt sorry for him. I really felt sorry for him. I didn't. Like, I could empathize with him a lot. Maybe not sympathize. No, I could sympathize with him, sorry, okay, but not sympathize, empathize, maybe. not empathize, sure. I'll, sympathize, I'll, not empathize. I'll give you that. I'll give you that. And I wish I had the option to convince him that there was a third way, that there, there had to be some kind of compromise instead of him getting beat down like this. Right, but if he did that, then that really wouldn't allow for story advancement. I know, it's, it's, it was like impractical, but yeah. kind of from a, from a, if I was to take this out of a game and you know maybe turn it into an interactive novel or something, then... That would be sure. an option I would have wanted sure. to go with. But isn't that the ultimate expression of that little tidbit they added in the beginning about the history being told from the victors? Because uh-huh. he did do something uh-huh. that is exactly what he was doing, but we were the victor and we were doing it for the right reasons. And they said, well, he was doing it for the wrong reasons, right? But it's yeah. very similar to what we did. Yeah, Maybe right. the, the only difference is the scale, right? 
Yeah. I mean, well, I when Karapak begged just to kill him, and just said death rough. is denied. Yeah, that, that was rough. That was oh God, I felt for him for that. Yeah, and and it just goes to the whole point that you don't piss off an elder god because you do not piss off an elder god. These things are implacable aliens. <laughs> you don't fuck with an elder god. This is, I think, one of the biggest lessons from this quest is that it's kind of really appreciating exactly what we're up against. I hope you're watching Thoros. <laughs> Keep an eye on this, right? <laughs> yeah, what's he up to at this stage? It doesn't right? work out well. Yeah, yeah that's he's... another theory I thought is that some people thought we might see Zaros make an appearance here, but not a one. Not a one. He's he's off doing his own mysterious things. Or he's sulking. I can't really yeah. tell which at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. So after this, and you know, we'll of course talk to uh, talk about the whole wind up in this about the, whether or not that was the right thing to do in our questions. But after this, the cavern, of course, starts collapsing and you have two minutes to get out. Um, you basically have to run and then various objects will fall down and you'll have to try and find a way out. And then Thok and Charles in various forms will um, make those objects disappear. And then When Thok appeared, he had his own little jingle. He had a Thok jingle. It was so funny. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty good. Uh... And then at the end, you make your way out of the – or out to the door. You don't make your way out yet, but um, we have another rough. We have another appearance of an Elder God. Full awakens. Yeah. And Full is the Elder God who created the Tokar. She's kind of associated with lava and fire. Yeah. So um, anytime an, a volcano is going to go blow, it's probably from Full. Yeah. That's what happened. She kind of made the volcano. She awoke. She made the volcano erupt and destroyed the entire lab. Yeah. And, you know, we're quite honestly lucky here. And it was inferred that based on our actions here of helping the Elder Gods is that if Full wanted to, she could have made the eruption strong enough that it would have completely destroyed the island. Yeah. That was the alternative. Um, but yeah, and then that's it. And that's quest complete. You head back to Berthorpe, talk-, talk with Saren, uh, tell her what happened. And An- Anachronia was calm and still. And you can choose whether to tell Saren about the uh, the Shadow Anima re- I did. revelation or not. I did. I did. Okay. So we all did. <laughs> yeah. No, I didn't. Okay. You didn't. She'll need to know about that. No one, no one needs to know. No one needs to know about my, secret, my superpower. So it just ended for you then? Yeah. Um, if you tell her, she basically says this, that um, her and the others will be prepared if anything starts to happen to you. And then that's it. Quest complete. Yeah. And that's kind of ominous in its own way. So Very ominous. Um. Let's do the rewards and then give it a rating and then we'll uh, move on into our other discussion. I realize we're uh, pushing the time limit here. and I'm, What I'm going to do is I'm actually going to just say to our listeners that if that we do have patch notes for this week. They're really not that amazing. They're produced in the show notes if you want to read them. I just want to keep talking about this quest, so we're going to do that. Um, but rewards from this quest were three quest points. 20,000 archaeology XP in the form of a lamp, 20,000 combat XP in your chosen skill, the cosmic focus, Thok stick, cosmetic override, a Remo totem base, and the ability to complete the Desperate for Artifacts archaeology collection. And I want to go through these. I'm going to start with um, the most benign of them, the Remo totem base. This is a. Is new- it Remototem or the Remototem? Because <sighs> <laughs> I think Remototem sounds a bit funnier. Yeah, you're right. You're right. <laughs> you're right. Um, you get the base from the quest. You get the top from selling animals at the uh, ranch out of time. And you get the middle piece from mining anywhere on Anachronia. And when you put this totem together, there's a new totem stand and base camp that you need to build. Uh, with the totem base and some base camp ingredients, which you should have enough of those by now. And what this does is it allows you to just power this one totem, and it will power all the totems you have placed on Anachronia. 
so you don't need to run around to them. Uh, this was actually suggested by the peg to have an easy way to I mean, activate these totems. Yeah. It, it, it's it's par for cool, the course, but, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, exactly. Because who wants their wants to make sure their totems work? Um, and the and the bad part is like that's probably the one totem that I could easily get, and it isn't going to mean anything if I don't have the others. Right. <laughs> Um, I know whenever I do clue scrolls, I use the treasure one. If I'm thieving, when yak tracks come around, I use the thieving one. Um, I'm really not much else on the totem bandwagon at this point, but it's a fun little reward to have. The more interesting reward, of course, is the cosmic focus. And this is the item that you get from completing the quest. Like it's, it's just, it was what we were alluded to, um, when they started talking about this, the archeology span item that would help with the archaeology skill what happens with this one you have it in your inventory i thought it was going to be a relic but if you have it in your inventory it will prevent spite sprite focus from dropping below 10 percent when you're excavating which is pretty good but there's more the desperate for artifacts collection which you complete by going into that uh northeast area where um, I think the Orth and Dig site is going to be where we did the two puzzles earlier on in the quest. There's two archaeology hotspots in there, one at level 70, one at level 90. And in there, you unearth two extra artifacts that can be uh, restored with Orth and Glass. And you hand those two artifacts into Giles at the base camp, and you're given the second um, bit of... Um, item which i believe is called the cosmic pyramid i think it was cosmic accumulator no the no cosmic accumulator you combine the focus yeah. and the pyramid to create the cosmic accumulator yeah yeah and what this does the cosmic accumulator is it prevents sprite focus from now dropping below 20 percent, and it provides a one percent chance to add in an additional uh, sprite focus gain for 60 seconds. So if you're wearing the archaeology cape and this procs off, every time you are chasing the sprite focus, you're going to get plus four instead of plus three. Sprite focus. This gain. implies that uh, time sprites have some connection with anima. Yep. Which I like. Yep, I agree. I agree. Um, I'd also well, like to. I didn't even know I was supposed to see Giles, so. Where is he at again? Uh, base camp. Base camp. <laughs> base camp. Kind of base camp. Yep. Like, that's a pretty large area. Like, if you buy... Up the, top by the bank. The, up top. Okay. Awesome. And I'd also like to point out that this second piece of this uh, reward requires 90 archaeology to finish. Oh. To unlock. Darn it. Oh. Got me. Get good. God, oh, no. <laughs> what the burn? You don't have 90 archaeology? No, sure. I don't. Oh. I have 90 archaeology. Okay, fair enough. Um, but yeah, those are the rewards from the quest. And, you know, there, there's something else that I think we should just mention here is that pretty much all these rewards, except for the totem, were teased in the lead up to this quest. The cosmic focus and the thock stick was. We didn't know about the Desperate for Artifacts collection, so that was an extra reward. Um, how do we feel about them revealing two out of the four rewards for this? Two out of the it four was pretty good. rewards. They did a, a really solid effort of promoting this quest and kind of building the hype yeah. around it yeah. in quite an unprecedented way. Um, and this was definitely part of that. So, yeah, good effort for them. All right. Well then, uh, ratings out of five. Tannis. I'm going to give it a... You know what? I don't have any complaints. So like... A five, I guess. Ooh. All right. Yeah. Diana? I'm going to give it a four. All right. I'm going to um, go... Okay. I'll, I'll let you explain why. I was very pleasantly surprised by it. I thought it was really solid, uh, very concise, well-written, really nice story, some great reveals for the end. I'm not giving it a five 
because there have been better quests. Yeah. I would give uh, Fate of the Gods, One of a Kind, Needle Skips. Those are my five quests, my five out of five quests. And this wasn't quite on that level. So, yeah, four out of five for me. All right, fair enough. Um, I'm going to go four out of five as well because, you know, I, I feel like for a quest to get a five out of five, it needs to, you know, be truly groundbreaking in the way it tells a story, groundbreaking in terms of the lore it reveals. Um, this quest was perfectly good. And, you know, it just progressed the storyline on that front. So it, it's not necessarily as groundbreaking as the rest of them could be. So I'm going to go four as well. That being said, I did really enjoy it. Yeah, excellent. And it kind quest. of re re-sparked my interest in RuneScape lore because I was very... That before I played this quest, I was kind of thinking, oh, once I'm done with archaeology, I'm probably going to be done with the game for a while. Yeah, yeah. Um, but this is kind of really brought me back in, in we should way, have a talk so. with Sirion about this about because he really didn't like the way desperate times went i think you like this one more than desperate times which and is see good. if that redeemed what happened in that quest for him um, i mean that's part of how it how why i give it such a high score because like i said i'm coming directly off desperate times and it sucked i did not enjoy any part of that like the story was fine but the quest itself, it was just bad. Like, I, I didn't enjoy it. Um, but to be able to go through this quest, that makes me really happy right there. Like, like when I say no accessibility barriers, uh, that's kind of a big deal. And that's like, really I, good. And I did cruise through. I didn't have any of that. Like, anything that was, like, puzzle challenging this way was puzzle challenging. It wasn't accessibility related. It's just... You know, like I hate puzzles, so I can deal with that kind of thing. But, um, but the strength of the characters, I just I can't get over Hannibus and Karos and Bob, oh. and they were so like I don't they know. They were it, really strong, weren't they? Yeah, and it they made me want really like strong. like I literally asked Shane if I'm like, hey, you think you can make it through Temple of Animishi? Because I've never made it through, and I kind of want to know the lore now, like kind of want to know more about i want to do the blackstone um quest now like and i didn't i didn't have to do them and if i don't have to do a quest i don't go out of my way to do it and now i kind of want to so yeah yeah and, and that's good if it's I, I, sparking that interest yeah i just to jump off that comment about the strength of the character writing for a second i think it's particularly noticeable with carapac and I'm going to briefly compare him with Sluske. Um, Those are the bit two big antagonists we've faced so far in the Sixth Age. And the trouble with Sluske was that he was too vague. And I know that was part of his character. He was this trickster. He was working in the shadows. Yeah. He never really revealed what was going on. But because of that, like, look at the kind of quest, kind of spoilers, lore, channel has been full of arguments lately about what did Sliske actually want. And it's not clear. Yeah. Compare and that to Kara. And I found that, that to me, that made him really hard to, uh, when I say get behind as a villain, that doesn't mean to be on his side, but to kind of make him believable as someone to fight against. Karapak, on the other hand, had a really solid motivation. We knew exactly what he wanted. And in this quest, we knew exactly how he was going to do it. And to me, that made him a far stronger and more compelling villain or oh, antagonist, not villain, because of it, because I could kind of empath sympathize with where he was coming from. Yeah, they were the complexity to Karapak. Uh, there's a, there was a complexity with Saliske, but I mean, at the same time, he was also a tool because like at the end of Desperate Times, you find out you think you're tough, but you're only doing what Guthix wants you to do anyway. So, you know, there's a discussion of fate right there yeah mm -hmm. um, um but carapac had a more he had a complexity to where you know like how like in like mob movies gangsters they're they're always a sympathetic kind of a person you know what i mean like mm -hmm. they might be gangsters but we don't involve women and children or we might be gangsters but we don't mess with innocent people we only you know business moral business. code a villain yeah. moral code it's always so much more interesting than a uh <laughs> the thing i didn't like was this guy and this is probably gonna 
make Raven look like me, not like me, but I don't like Joker type villains. People who want to watch the world burn yeah. for no reason. And, and I this is... cannot get behind that in fiction. It just doesn't gel with me at all. And that's what I didn't like about this. And this is one thing I want to uh, hone in on it with this is that looking at that, you're entirely right. The whole thing from missing presumed death to Sliske's endgame, that arc was built around Sliske the Jester trying to offer up the Stone of Jazz to one of these elder gods, or to sorry, to one of the gods. But in the end, Karapak comes in and destroys the stone, which in hindsight really, and I'm going to say this and I don't want anyone to shoot me for it, I think it diminishes that entire plot point that we did in that entire God storyline. And, you know, this is one thing I want to explore in another monthly bit at some point in the future is what if after the world wakes, what if instead, and what if instead we started off with the elder gods? I feel like there would have been more arguments about pacing at that point, but the, 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 the real point I want to make about this guy is that people are still arguing about his motivations. People are still wondering what exactly it was he wanted. Was he working for jazz? Was he a tool? Was he just bored? Was he doing this? Was well, he wasn't doing he that? the agent of Zaros? Was he an agent of Zaros? Was he an agent of Chaz? That's the way I view it. He was an agent of well, Zaros. To this try is what and I mean. Zaros like, there's so ascend. many interpretations about what did he actually yeah. want that his weight as a villain was diminished. Yeah. Karapak, on the other hand, kind of slightly more. Uh, I think it kind of slightly more maturity of writing. We know what he wants. And, and like Tanner said, he's got a moral code, sort of. And the thing is, he's, with this, we're two quests in, and we're already more committed to this storyline, and there's more at stake. And it's ultimately, I'm going to say, evolving to be winding up in a better situation than the Sliske arc did. Possibly too early to say, but I do think they have may have learned some lessons from how the Sliske arc yeah. turned out. And, I'm gonna, one, and people but, are going to not like me for this, but I'm going to say that we would have likely seen a more measured approach with that Sliske arc. And the reason I go back to this is one of the polls they did with player power, and Tani still remember this from her player power bit. One of the polls they did was that what kind of quest would you like? Would you like an Elder Gods quest? Would you like a Sixth Age Sliske quest? Or they called it a Sixth Age Gods quest. An Elder Gods quest or a quest not related to these kind of things. And I think it was 17% said that they wanted another uh, type of quest that wasn't either of those. The God quest won with 50%. And I think somewhere in the 30s was the Elder Gods. And because of that, I point to this and I th just have to say, looking back on it, the Sliske arc doesn't seem that serious compared to this. And I think the Sliske arc building up to this though that would be why yeah but did you need all that other straight. i mean sure it was narrative building and whatnot but did you really need all that to get to that point and kick us off well, on this path imagine what would have happened if they'd killed gothics and immediately ratcheted the, the tension up so high that we're facing down the the creators the very like the universe's creators that would have felt very rushed there yeah. used to be some kind of yeah. padding or filler so you kind of slowly ratchet up the tension a little bit and i still feel like that maybe it was a little bit rushed and yeah, i've seen and, some and, other people criticizing it as being too rushed and i mean they could have done different stuff too in that arc but the point that we're getting at with this is that this storyline right now seems so much more powerful than that other one and i don't mean it in the sense that we're dealing with elder gods i just mean it seems so much more grounded and so much more realistic like you said from the villain stance well and it also seems i mean this is a lot this is consequential right like i know it's used a lot to end of the world type of thing and i mean this is very end game ish with pulling in every prominent npc <laughs> you know in one place we're all gonna work together um but it i think there's something to be said that like it is much more i felt it's a, a lot more consequential um yeah than the Soliske arc was yeah all right. Um, I want to move on to questions right now, and the patch notes are in the show notes for anybody who uh, wants to read them. There's nothing too groundbreaking that was 
uh, brought in, but I'll just mention a couple of the little hot fixes that they did. Uh, the Dungeoneering Hole could be accessed uh, during happy hour, even at the full temperature gauge. That's been fixed. They reduced the chance of res- receiving skip tokens on the beach. Too many were coming in. And farming and Dungeoneering XP on the beach was uh, no longer scaled down if you're leveling past 99. Uh, Those are the ones I wanted to talk about. Also, the Ninja Dojo is temporarily closed to let them go through the 6,000 plus submissions that they have. And the EI, EI Dino grace period has been extended from the 120 Herb Lore and Farming Launch. It's been extended by three months. Okay. So it's going to be a full year now that you're going to have to have completed this. And hey, you know what? You didn't hear that much complaining, huh? Because it wasn't tied to their boss thing game. <sighs> da, 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 da. And that's and that's the whole damn hey, reason wine, with wine. this. Like, I don't know. I still don't think we should have grace periods, but that's just me. All right, before we move on to our questions, because we do have lore questions uh, for this episode, um, I'll just thank our Patreon supporters for making this week's episode possible and everything that we do. I'd like to thank this week Brock H., Cameron, Cass, CGB900, Christian S., Diana, Duramax, Enrique V., Jade Gizmo, JW, James W., Jason S., Joe M., John P., Kyle, Mr. Ling, Nora, our memories, Rastafa, Ricky A, Ripeth, Samantha R, the Naked Captain, the Lion, Tom V, Zant, and Zez. Thank you all of you for your support. It truly means the world to us. It let's us do all sorts of fun little things. And in case you're wondering what this is all about, just visit us at patreon.com slash rsbnb. You can sign up there, and for as little as a dollar a month, you gain access to the entire back catalog of monthly bits. You get a mention in the show notes. You, of course... Also, uh, get to vote in our monthly bit topics, which we currently uh, got a poll up for this month, um, what we're going to release in the first week of August. Uh, We got some good ones this month. We already uh, got some votes on this one. Choices are the rise and fall of the Java client in alternate history, invention wins over Prif in the first player power poll, and how old school came to be. So if you want to vote in those, you can. You get access to the entire back catalog of monthly bits for as little as a dollar a month. We also have two additional tiers where um, for $3 a month, you get a special VIP rank on Discord and a mention on the podcast at the start of the month and access to high-quality stereo AAC versions of the show. And finally, for $5 a month, you get a special shout-out each and every week and exclusive access to the outtakes that we use to make the clip show at the end of the year and you know with all this you get the monthly bit you get the inside rsb and b update you get our round table which i think for august we'll do at or around double xp week or double xp live and of course movie night poll for that will be going up after the monthly bit poll so if all this sounds interesting to you or you just want to support the podcast for as little as a dollar a month just head on over to patreon.com slash rsb and b thanks so much everyone Thanks, guys. All right. We do have questions about the quest this week. So starting off, a uh, question from Probably Writing. Uh, from your perspective, how do you think Shadow Anima works? Is it anti-anima? Does it corrupt other anima or merely consume it? And why did Gothics have control over it? All right. How do I answer this uh, quickly? I think if it was anti-anima, and I want to pick at this one first, if it was anti-anima, the way we understand anti-matter, Shadow anima would annihilate regular anima if it was effectively anti anima. Is that not what it does? Well, if we I suppose had, it more it more kind of poisons and corrupts. Yeah, it, it poisons it and corrupts stuff. rather than you know completely destroys, right? Yeah. So that's why I feel that calling it anti anima is probably not right. And you know, I I think a way this could all be tied together. Um, it's a corruption effect, which we've seen many, many times before. We've seen that, you know, in Elite Dungeon 2, as we mentioned. We've also, of course, seen corruption. And I don't know, and 
this might be stretching it if it could have been Shadow Anima at play for this, but the Dark Lord in the Plague's End. It's in Plague's End. It's in Apisandra in the Gnome Quest. Yeah. There's yeah. the corruption that there. It's kind of a theme that comes up again and again and again. I have in Sofenheim Dungeon. So yep. Yeah. All that kind of stuff um, there. There's a, there's a lot of that around. And, you know, we're, we're, we're pulling at various things that exist in the world. And the question is, is this shadow animal or is it just other forms of corruption that has been written? And it, I think it's the option of the narrative writers in the next quest that follows where they'll have an option to tie all this together and say that, you know, is the Dark Lord corruption shadow anima? Is the gnome corruption shadow anima? Is the corruption we see in Elite Dungeon 2? I think it definitely is in that case. And in Sophonim as well. It, are all these things linked together? And I think if that's the case, it can form a greater uh, story around shadow anima. And Maybe, and uh, maybe it just comes from a higher level of being. And that, John and I might have a theory for what it is, or the anti-god. <laughs> That's kind of what I was thinking. What if there's, you know, at some point another, or at some I point think... in the past, there was another form of entity as powerful as an elder god, and there's that collection of elder gods operating somewhere else in the universe too i don't think it's anything to do with the elder gods specifically all right i think it is kind of the dragonkin's fault um because it seems to all come from them Karapak was the first to make it i believe it is because of the dragonkin's survival from their revision from their universe they're not meant to be here they're meant to be dead but they survived and they brought some of their universe, some of the anima that they make as a living thing into ours. And I, that's where I think the shadow anima, I think it's only called shadow anima because of how it interacts with the magic and the anima of right, our universe. Right, because it's from a shadow universe. The, Not even a shadow universe, but from a dead universe. A dead universe, yes. That the, there, that the Dragon King came from. Whoa. Yeah, and The Dragon King brought it through by simply by their, just by being alive, they brought it through. And, that would make them be me in the jazz, wouldn't it? Well, it this is to do with the elder. This is I did think about this quite a bit. Like the the elder gods, whenever they do a revision, they wipe the slate clean and they start again. So maybe, and each time they start again, the universe they create is kind of iterative. So when it, whatever they create one time around, they consume it chew it all up, spit it back out again, and the next time they do it, it's slightly different. It's more advanced. It creates more things, more life. So maybe the anima of a previous revision is toxic to the anima of a current one. Yeah, that, that, that's something I'd be willing to uh, go for on that sense, rather than my elder god, or sorry, negative elder god theory, let's just call it on that. And so I, I think that's why it would be toxic to them as well. Yes. Yeah, um, because because, it, it, because it's like if you're it's it's like and I'm going to use this person's name here. If you're writing something and you're iterating on that, sure, you you might say this was good, but if you look back at something that you did from ten, fifteen years ago, you're probably not going to like it very much. And it, it's like. That's kind of my theory at the moment. And um, so yeah, it's just kind of the leftover anima from a universe that is dead from things that should be dead but aren't. Yeah. And, and then and the question is, how does it get everywhere world. else that we see it? Yeah, I wonder what it's got to do with the Shadow Realm. Oh. And how much of it is also to do with creatures like the Majorat, oh, that's who good. are of this revision but have access to kind of ancient elements and i wonder is that kind of you know ma being half dead and bringing stuff over from the last revision could that be it as well and they have access to this I, the thing that came back to me when i was thinking about this was from last rune fest mod jack did a reading of a law book where he talked about the shadow leviathan and it's this massive creature that lives in the shadow realm and it consumes things and this was a book written by a dragonkin. 
and that was what came to me when I was thinking about shadow anima and like, okay, that maybe there's a link with the shadow realm. Maybe there's a link with ancient magic stuff that shouldn't be alive, but is, and is kind of chafing against the life that should be here. Yeah, that makes sense. And, you know, we've seen this all along from the very beginning uh, in uh, the dig site quest and then later desert treasure and the first inklings of Zaros, everything to do with the shadow realm and the shadows, so to speak, anywhere you look on RuneScape, you wind up in a situation where it's a power that isn't necessarily good, but it's certainly very powerful and it's certainly very different. And maybe, just maybe, uh, it's remnants seeping through. And if this is how they're going to all tie it together, I think that'd be very interesting. Yeah, maybe it's because there should have been a clean slate. There should have been a clean break and there wasn't. And that's how we got all these other things like ancient magics and why Zaros is so interested in, in that. It allows him to gain power and the like. But the second part of the question, why did Guthics have control over it? That and, is something. I and to be to able to graft that. it to us. And I think someone replied to that. This was a question on Twitter. And someone replied, like, what's the scarier option? Guthics actually having control over Shadow Anima or Guthics not really having control of it and just kind of desperately trying something, anything to try and protect us? Which would be worse? <laughs> <laughs> and, we, and, you know, we can't exactly ask him on this. So. No. Um, we do know that Guthix was kind of uncommonly powerful for a god, and he did have a very, very close connection with Gilinor's anima. Yeah, he was on the tier of Saren and uh, Zaros. He was, he was a, an ascendant god who matched the transcendent gods for their power, and his power came directly from Gilinor's anima because it's where he'd been sleeping all this time. So maybe he did have some measure of control over it. Maybe as he was dying, he tried something desperately and just so happens to do that who knows um i don't really have an answer to the second half yeah i don't it seemed like he had a plan though at the end of like when you see him talking with sliska at the end of desperate times like it it really seems like he had that planned out true all that um would that be kind of a plan in advance or would that be kind of he knows sliska is coming to kill him got to think of something um, yeah, I don't, I mean, I don't know. Do you ever have that feel from Gothix? Well, I, I mean, I mean he, he had to have known that this was toxic to, to the Elder cool. Gods, right? He must have known that it was kind of an anti-God thing. Yeah, so that's why he would graft it to us. Um, the thing with Gothix, the more we learn about him, the more we realize how cold he was. Yeah, and Ma- Gray is what I was thinking. Uh, He's not benevolent, and he was willing to do very bad things for the greater good. So that's something to bear in mind when discussing this. But yeah, I don't really have much of an answer to why Gothics has seemed to have some kind of control over Shadow Anima. Nor do I. And um, I don't think anything like that was mentioned in um, the World Wake, was it? No. Nothing at all. So it, it could just be something that was, um, you know, put in the storyline uh, over top of it. But we do have the ability to access Guthix's memories, don't we? If we can go back to his homeworld or something, right? Um, or am I remembering wrong? I don't recall ever accessing his memories. I think. Are you thinking of Saren and Zaros? No. We get his memories at the shrine. Yeah, that's the shrine and the engrams. Okay. Uh, where you find like the, the divination right? Okay. I'm just trying to think of a way they could, you know, write more gothic lore into the game with him being dead. Um, we haven't found the elder, elder Halls of Gielinor yet. No. There might be some we've more. On, there might we've be seen some them more. on Frenesky, but we haven't seen them on Gielinor. Yeah, so there might be some more gothic memory shards there we could use. So there's an op- opportunity Speak, in the speaking future. Speaking of Shadow Realm actually going back, I wonder if this is why Slisko was so interested in us in the first place. Yes, yes. Why was he so interested in us all? Yeah, that's exactly it. That's exactly why. That's exactly why. 
it makes yeah, sense. It's, it's such an interesting concept and like i didn't see it coming yeah at and, all. and did, did they write this in 2013 that there was shadow anima grafted onto us or is this a 2020 invention I don't know. I'd, I'd really like to know that yeah. um but I don't think I do a spice question next because it's also related to Shadow Anima. Yeah, yeah, let's let's do that. We have them a bit out of order here in the doc. But thank you, probably writing for that question. That was a really uh, inspiring one on that. Uh, the next one uh, from uh, Taffing Spy. Do you have any opinions on Shadow Anima potentially being related to Zautac in any way, or if Shadow Anima is ready? Related to the corruption of Ma's egg, and on that train of thought, why would Wen even use it? Yeah, so that's I, something else we at, haven't really touched on. Zautak, eh? So Zautak has a lot of connections with the Dragon Kin. Um, we kind of learned that through the uh, Elite Dungeon series yeah. with the Ambassador. Yeah, ED three. Yeah, mentions of the Black Stone of the corruption of. Zaltak being this beast beyond the veil that no one's really met and no one's come across. No one knows what it is, even. Um, so it could be potentially part of whatever Zaltak is. Um, I think there's definitely a path that could link them together in future stories, but at the moment it's still up in the air to me. Yeah, and my understanding after Elite Dungeon 3 and Curse of the Blackstone is that Zautak is no longer a threat. At the moment, yeah. At the moment, yeah. Um, um, Mars Egg. Yeah. Ooh, hard to tell. Um, what exactly is this uh, referring to? Forget my, forget my ignorance on so, this. Uh, Ma was born somehow defective right um not the right power i think they said she never really woke up right stillborn and stillborn basically and whenever during fate of the gods whenever you go down to the elder halls and you see the five eggs mars egg has been broken somehow and this is just a visual clue but it's got kind of shards of ice in it and they look very similar to what Wen's egg looked like. So the implication is is that Ma was somehow hurt by Wen, presumably deliberately, for some reason. Which is a bit weird, because they needed all five Elder Gods to create a new universe. Ma was potential, that's what she stood for. And that's what she was. She's a manifestation of potential when it comes to, you know, creation. So why would Wen kill her, basically? Or reduce it to such a state that she wasn't really capable of, of creating anymore. Why would when? Why would her sister do that? And maybe she used shadow anima. I think that's and again another thing that could be explored in future, but tenuous and up in the air at this stage. Yeah, and you know I, I think when is probably the other god that we've heard the least about. I think mm, she's. I think she's inversion. snapping under ice mountain. Snapping under Ice Mountain, and I believe she has some kind of connection to the monolith in archaeology. There's some speculation that that is one of her elder artifacts. Hmm. Um, or what yeah. yet? Okay. From there's a, there's a piece of concept art that's been circulating around that has the five uh, elder god kind of aesthetics printed up, and Wens is the one that's highlighted for the monolith. Yeah. That her, her artifacts are the needle um, because Wenla is the word of power for the needle and yeah, the mysterious monolith in archaeology. Those are her things. Right. Why would she kill Ma? It's still unclear. Oh, so many questions that this one opens up here on this. Um, and, Great couple of questions. Yeah, and you know, I, I, th I think at some point and what we need to really unearth on this one is figure out what exactly the full year's worth of story is going to be. We know this one touches on archaeology, but they did say that there was a full year's worth of story effectively backed up with archaeology or that archaeology would be backing up in relations to quest and lore throughout this. So I 
guess from this what happens next with the Elder Gods, and in particular, when on this front, uh, could be answered by archaeology, perhaps. Possibly. I'm looking forward to it whenever it happens. Yeah. For sure. All right. Uh, should we move on to the next question from Mr. Ling? Unless, Tannis, do you have anything? I don't, actually. I, I don't have a clue. All right. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Tapping yep. Spy. Uh, Mr. Ling, how many bugs did you encounter during the quest? And did you think the quest was going to end the way it did? Um, the only bug I encountered was I had to re-log when I was using the measure to get it to activate. Yeah, I, I, had, to, I had serious problems with the measure. Like, you could drop it on its head and it didn't go <laughs> off. And, and yeah, I yeah. pretty much would have to re-log, I, what, there was four times? I probably had to do it three times. Really? Yeah. Yeah, um, and I think some people were also crashing in one of the cutscenes that they're still trying to uh, figure out what exactly um, that was about. So, you know, I, I think we're we're all lucky that we didn't have cutscene crashes, so that's good. I saw a couple of typos in the dialogue as well, which was very irritating, but other than that, um, not a lot from me. Yeah, good. Yeah. I good. thought the swing of the stick was a bug, but um, it sounds like it was at least uh, did you think the quest was going to end the way it did? No. 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 Parapat getting rebound to Jazz blindsided. No, no I totally did yeah. not expect that. Um, it's as, going to be really pissed. As we <laughs> mentioned. <laughs> We're like number one. He's going to kill us. Yeah, as we mentioned, we I thought Hannibus was going to croak at a couple of times uh, throughout this quest. Yeah. So uh, um, there's that. Also, yeah, the, just the reveal with Shadow Anima, I think, was so left of field. And the big question for me is what's Jas going to do when she finds out? Finds out what about... Are the, about our soul carrying Shadow Anima and being immune like that. Well, what are the Elder Gods Couldn't she do? sense that? Well, I don't know. Is that why she chose us to be the voice? Is that for the way she treated Karapak for using shadow anima yeah hmm. wasn't great what's she going to do when she figures out <laughs> that we're made of it or and, that we and, have and it our protection it? our shadow anima protection also protects us from the elder gods right to an extent possibly well um, it was protecting him right that was the barrier yeah, yeah so and, it must and that's the sense that i got is that it will protect us as well Unless we got a, a tuned version of it from Gothics. But. Unless some adventurer comes sneaking on our stuff and then puts a piece of a god in our face. Oh, uh, yeah, I'm just saying. Yeah. <laughs> oh, how the tables have turned. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah no, I think that this the, the ending of this quest was really a surprise for me. And yeah. That was one of the appeals. Yeah, definitely. I agree. Thank you, Mr. Ling. And from Sunset Fish, how did you discover RuneScape, and what do you think you would be doing if you never did? <laughs> well, you know, I was actually thinking about this one, and I discovered RuneScape because my great friend Mike showed me the game one day. Uh, he built some calculators and a forum signature. I said, let's build a website. That led to something called forums back in the day, which, you know, everybody doesn't use today. And that led to the podcast, which is, of course, where we're at today. And that has just grown and grown and grown over time. Um, we've met many great people because of that, such as Earth. That's where my relationship with Clan Quest comes in. Sirion, you, Diana. Um, and, you know, it's a, it's actually a really interesting path on this. I think it's perhaps been one of the most impactful things in my life. And if I would, God, if, if I wasn't doing this, I'd probably be, you know, off in some corner. I probably would have doubled down and would probably be doing some sort of show or some sort of production about abstract concepts in computer science or something. Who knows? Nerd. <laughs> How about you guys? Uh, either of you guys go first. Doesn't matter to me. Diana. Oh, okay. Um, this is really going to state my age, 
but I first discovered RuneScape when I was 10. Um, my older brother started playing it. He's only a year older than me. We were both at primary school at the time. And it was kind of a phase going around his friends. And he started playing it. And then I started playing it. And this was back in the day when um, only one person could be on the computer at any one time because AOL couldn't cope with it otherwise. <laughs> and we were allowed half an hour on at a time before dad needs to use the phone and, and all that jazz. Um, but yeah, that's when I first started playing. It was kind of in year five and year six at primary school. Um, and then I took a break when I was in high school because, you know, GCSEs got in the way. I had exams and stuff like that. And then I picked it up again uh, after I finished my uh, A-level exams. So I was kind of 18-ish. Um, I was taking a break before my university and I thought, oh, maybe I'll see if this game's still going. And it turns out it was. It was kind of just, I think, a couple of years after the RS3 release. Okay. Um, and I was coming in with all these uh, these sixth age storylines and the improved graphics and and we recruited you at RuneFest, I think, right? Yes, yeah, so it was RuneFest yeah, was... 2017 when okay. I first met the clan quest guys, and I kind of bounced around between a few quests before a few clans beforehand before finding clan quest. Yeah, um, met a couple of people in person at clan quest, got recruited, and um, yeah, got my P mod a couple of years ago, and yeah, kind of gone, gone onwards and upwards from there. Um, what do I think I would be doing if I never had found RuneScape? I think I would have taken a very different career path. Um, and this might sound a bit odd, but RuneScape got me into game development and RuneScape got me into game writing. Um, and you would have been a geologist otherwise, right? I would have probably stayed in science. Okay. Uh, my my degree is in physical chemistry. I was doing laser chemistry for uh, my okay. masters. I thought I thought so, it was geology. Okay. Uh no, <laughs> it was uh, yeah physical chemistry. So I probably would have stayed on that. You know, I'd be doing a PhD now instead of being working in game development. Um, and I can't really emphasize how much Jagex as a company has influenced that. I know they get knocked sometimes for how they throw their weight behind diversity drives. But a couple of years ago, they did a video showcasing all the women who work for them. And that was what went behind my decision to start applying for game development jobs. I can pin it down to that video. Because I finally realized, after six years of thinking, oh, people like me don't make games, that loads of people like me make games, and there is space for me there. So, so, what, so what I'm getting from this is that for the 20th anniversary, we all owe them a huge debt of gratitude. <laughs> I mean, I just, I just want to give them a bit of credit for where I am right now. And I've got a huge amount of personal satisfaction of it as well. Like I've made some really great friends and I've had some fantastic experience at RuneFest. And, you know, I've made a, I've written a webcomic. I've, I've written fan fiction. I, I've been involved in so much cool stuff because of discovering RuneScape. And, yeah, I really appreciate that. Nice. Tannis? Yeah, I'm probably doing my PhD now. <laughs> Instead, my parents would be far happier with where I am right now. <laughs> Um, well, I mean, I've, I've told a story on the show before, but, um, I was in college and mind you, I mean, I'm much, much later. So like I am in college when most people would have been doing masters. I was doing undergrad, right? So a little bit of a delay there, but, um, this was pre windows seven, right? So I guess it would have been like, oh, seven, oh, eight like that I, I don't know um anyway i didn't have it yet and, and so um i wanted to play this new well it wasn't really new but it was really popular at the time with this cool game called uh, world of warcraft i'm like yeah I, i'd be into that and i tried to play it and i couldn't because my software wouldn't wouldn't run like it only ran in windows and you, it was really hard to get games into like that Windows mode at that time, like you had to. It was just a pain. Anyway, screen it could reader be done, software. But it was, yeah, it, it it just. Anyway, um, someone had mentioned RuneScape. I'm like, well, I'll give that a try because they said it w would run in the browser. I'm like, okay, well, if it's in the browser, then Zoom Text will work, and I, maybe I'll get a chance to try it. And at that time, it worked 
not only did it work, but it worked even better because it was like a point and click, which helped me um, be able to kind of use my magnifier and not, um, you know, be like frantic and trying to move. And then I discovered that this game, not only was it, um, not only was it fun, it was medieval and it was everything that I was looking for. I was looking for a strong character building type RPG game, right? MMO. Um, well, I didn't even know what an MMO was. I didn't care if anyone else was out there. I just wanted to play a real strong character building RPG. Um, and while doing that, I, I found that, um, so I had to like scan all my books into a scanner and that is, um, that can get real monotonous when oh, yeah. your major is history and all you do is research. And so you're just always scanning books. Like us. I was always scanning books and listening to books because that's how I would how I do it. I'd scan it in there and then it ran through another program and it would spit it out in an audible form. That gets you get really really tired doing that. And um, so RuneScape gave me something to do with my with my other hands and stuff to kind of like help me stay awake while I was listening to my books and um, you know taking my notes and doing my research and everything. So. Um, it was a lifesaver with that. And um, if it never came along, I don't know. According to Joe Rogan, I'd be a black belt in jujitsu by now. Or I, mean, I don't know. Uh, might be doing something worthwhile. <laughs> no. But, no, I probably would have stayed in the, in the console realm. Um, I was... I think about the same time I, I was playing RuneScape, I might have started playing Elder Scrolls, but I was a console gamer. And the reason I was a console gamer was, you know, it, you could get a big screen TV and I could, you know, like, that's how I would play my games. Um, come to find out, I didn't really need that, you know, later on. But I would have never gotten into PC gaming had it not been for RuneScape. There would have been no reason for me to to work on a PC like that. Like I would have, it just wouldn't have happened. I would have continued and I would have had a PS4 and Xbox one or something. Like I never would have gotten to PC gaming. So you know what? Maybe, uh, maybe I do owe him a debt of gratitude. All right. Wonderful. Thank you for your questions, everybody. If you want to send your own in, you can send them in on Twitter. Just send them to at RSBNB or you can email them to questions at RSBNB dot com as well now we're going to move on to tech news granted uh we are a little bit late so we'll be we'll be quick on these uh you know there's a grand hearing going on in the united states with the social media companies and with that some emails from 2012 and that a facebook ceo named mark zuckerberg sent in confidence to his chief financial officer Floated the idea of buying smaller competitors known as Instagram and Path. We all know Instagram, of course, but Path was a social network that offered some uh, competition to Facebook. And in these emails, it was lined up that they wound up coming up to an, an idea that, you know, there's actually, there's actually four different reasons why Facebook might decide to buy a company. And the four reasons suggested in the emails are, first, neutralizing a competitor, acquiring talent, integrating products to improve the Facebook service, or other. And the big hammer, of course, comes from neutralizing a competitor. Um, we know that, of course, people like to always say that, oh, we're we're acquiring talent or we're integrating their brand into ours to improve the way our service works but you know facebook has long said oh we're not a monopoly we don't seek to crush our competition but it just goes to show that you know especially in relation to instagram the main reason they bought instagram was that they felt that instagram would pose a huge threat to facebook from the network stance as such that was the reason they chose to buy instagram to neutralize them as a competitor and, you know, I think we all knew this is true. Uh, Facebook is out there so kind. Mark Zuckerberg with his little Android face thinks he's going to be all kind of innocent and bull crap like that. But, you know, the emails tell the true story on this. And I, I think we see precisely what Facebook is up to with this. So, yeah. 
Well, he's just an awful capitalist in my book anyway. (laughs) And, you know, know, the main reason we have this up here as a story is because Facebook and in particular Mark Zuckerberg has always said that, you know, hey, we're not anti-competitive. But lo and behold, here it shows in these emails. That's exactly what they were aiming to do back in 2012. And, you know, I I think we can all uh, see that on the wall with this so it'd be interesting to see what happens to facebook going forward on this exactly like it's the ultimate duh right like i don't care what a company says this they don't want competition like they'll say one thing but that's no they don't want it i I can't believe any like who would ever believe that no no we're 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 not trying to stay apart like I don't even know who would ever believe that. Yeah. Uh, Diana, what do you think about these emails and what Mark Zuckerberg <laughs> has to say in this day and age about this? Um, as someone who hates Facebook and really grudgingly uses Instagram, I have few opinions. Um, it's kind of one of those things where it's like big corporations being shitty to each other. What else is new? Yeah, and, and you know that, that like that's the thing. I absolutely hate these social media companies, but there is nothing else to use. And if you want to promote yourself, you want to promote what you're doing, you got to be on one of them, right? I'm, well, I'm only on Facebook to keep in touch with my parents right. and Instagram, I because I don't know why I use Instagram. It always it always hurts me. Yeah, well, well the why. same thing kind of with Twitter too. There's no competition for it, right? Yeah, so. That's true. Um, and, you know, we'll, of course, keep our eye on this to see what exactly happened. But some of these emails in here are truly damning. So if you enjoy this policy side aspect of it, give some of these emails uh, a read. Um, and, you know, I liked Path. It's it's a shame that we don't see any of these smaller social media companies come up in this day and age. And I think this email spells out why. Yeah, I mean, you have to... Uh... I mean, you have to kind of have some regulation on how big you want things to get if you want to stop them from eating everything in sight, right? Like, otherwise, a new person does it better comes along. Well, guess what? They own it now. They just bought that guy out. Yeah, and I don't think anybody really pictured what billion-dollar companies would look like doing this. Um, Amazon, Apple, Facebook, of course. Uh, Next piece of tech news, uh, Google is making advancements in the realm of backup. Previously, this service was only available for Android users. Now they're offering a new application that can be used for backup. It's called Google One. Previously, it was announced as a membership-only product that would allow you to effectively back up your Android device. But what's happened now, one year later, after they announced the Android version... They're expanding uh, the Google One feature set to uh, be free for all Google users wherever Google One is available, and that includes on iOS. And the big headline behind this in big, bold letters is that whether you're on Android or iOS, you can use Google One now to, for, for, for free, back up your phone. And if you're on iOS... Granted, it's tied into Android, so it'll just back everything up. But if you're on iOS, it will back up your photos, videos, and contact with uh, Google, in particular to the various uh, products on that. And, you know, it's kind of a way, I guess, to get people involved into Google Photos. And I've been pick of the week here before on the podcast because, you know, um, if you're just taking photos with your phone, and I think it's up to some absurd resolution. I don't remember what it is, but it's huge. You basically get free photo storage and you can store videos up to 1080p that you take on your phone as well for free. So this is the ultimate in terms of being able to, you know, just back up and keep all your photos around. This is expanding it out further and bringing it out to the device model. And it is now free. And you know what this is for? It's a whole grand gambit, I think, to get people into the Google ecosystem. Because, you know, you buy an Apple phone. Uh, Diana, do you use iOS or Android? Uh, I use Android. Okay, so uh, I don't know if you have much experience with it, but when you buy 
Apple device, you're effectively signing on to the Apple ecosystem in terms of, you know, everything. That's that why you I have, use Android. <laughs> everything you have is there from iMessage to photos uh, to your calendar. Calendar's a little bit less, but it all ties you in. And what Google wants to do with this, my theory, is that they want to bring the Google ecosystem to as many people as they can. And this is a wonderful way of doing it, in addition to providing backup as a service on a device. Um, I'd like to see if they did something like this for uh, desktop offering free backup uh, for your desktop stuff, because that'd be really neat as well if they did that. So uh, give that a check. Uh, I know, Tannis, you, you use Google Photos, right? Um, sometimes. And okay. I'm, there's actually a lot of things that I want to learn but, um, that, that Google has that I, I don't know how to use yet. Right. That will that this is going to be um, this should be good because this should work with like tablets, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, that's that's perfect because uh, yeah, I'm gonna need I need like something that I can use um, to set up measurements and like spreadsheets and stuff. Yeah, and well, with I was uh, gonna ask you about that stuff, yeah, so. sure. And with their backup and sync plan, uh, you get 15 gigs of free on your Google account, which you know factors into Gmail and all that other stuff like that. So if, if you're looking for a backup solution for your phone, this might be something to look at. And our last piece of tech news is technology-based, but it focuses on energy. And this is something you don't really hear about much. Normally, we, of course, when we talk about energy advancements, it's normally in the form of uh, safer nuclear and smaller nuclear, but Microsoft announced this past week that a hydrogen fuel cell successfully powered a row of its data center servers for 48 hours consecutively. And what they are aiming to do with this is become carbon neutral by 2030. And for anybody who's not aware of what a hydrogen fuel cell is, it basically, what happens is you feed water to the device and an electrolyzer splits the water into hydrogen and oxygen. The oxygen is stored or vented off, but the hydrogen is forced through the fuel cell. And the way that it works with the chemistry with that is the um, positive and negative charges of those hydrogen atoms are scraped off, generating electricity, which is... Adorably the, concise description of it. Very uh, yeah, good. very concise about how it works. And... The whole benefit of this is you get clean energy effectively from water that you're able to just vent the output of it into the environment if you want to. And it's a very, very clean form of energy. And we don't hear mu too much about hydrogen fuel cells, but the fact that Microsoft was able to power an entire row of servers for 48 hours says something. Because previously in their data centers, they had diesel generators as backup, but this is paving the way to larger uh, fuel systems that they're going to be able to use. This was a 250 kilowatt fuel system, but they have plans to test a three megawatt fuel system next. Hydrogen oh, fuels are an interesting one because it was all the range about, oh, I want to say, 15, 20 years ago yeah. in kind of chemistry. In and vehicles, and in, right? In vehicle fuels, it was going to be this thing that saved the world. But it's proven to be very difficult to get the kind of um, the right kind of fuel density you need for commercially viable cars and that sort of thing, which is kind of why it's died out. Um, well, so it's cool to hear that there's still research going on in it, and um, you know it is potentially going somewhere because you're right; it is very clean. Um, the only thing you need is water. Well, and isn't it a combination of that and oil was was brought pretty low? There just wasn't as much emphasis, it seems, to push that one. And I don't know why, because, I mean, solar's developed really well. Um, yeah, so, I, I mean, other other uh, green fuels have done have done well. But Yeah, and, and you know, there's lots of advancement is... happening with um, uh, Gen 4 nuclear, you know, smaller nuclear reactors. I think we talked about that before on well, the show. Forget, forget, forget that. France is going with the fusion, man. That's the internet. We're, we're we're moving into fusion. Uh, I I'm not I'm not, I'm not like sold on I'm not sold on fusion yet. And you know this could be an entirely different discussion <laughs> that we're having here on this. Give it twenty years. Yeah, twenty years. I'm not even sure that but, fusion is possible yet. 
Oh. But I mean, the, the nice thing about these hydrogen cells, though, is isn't hydrogen like the most numerous and gas yeah. in our atmosphere? Like, this well, not in our could atmosphere. be revolutionary, revolutionary if we did push this technology. Even if we could just do it at all of these data centers, like if we could power buildings from this and only have to use dirty fuel for our vehicles, that's still a huge improvement. Mm. Like. Yeah, you just need water. Yes, but if it's being used in other areas that aren't kind of commercial vehicles, that, that'd still be good. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, of course. All right. I enjoyed this one. And Tannis, we need to have a talk about the future of nuclear. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, wrapping up here, of course, uh, you guys are probably wondering what exactly is happening with Skill of the Month. We are hosting... Uh, two skill of the month competitions to coincide with double XP week. Uh, those 10 days, we are running a Herblore contest and a Slayer contest starting on August 7th and ending on the 17th. And, you know, it's, it's tied in with double XP weekend. So, you know, we'll see how many people want to kill and we'll see how many people, you know, want to spend their bank. Yeah. Perfect, perfect two skills for uh, Double XP Live, right? It is. Unfortunately, I can't afford Herblore, and I'm 120 Slayer, so it's like, uh, you know, I finally, I finally feel what you, I, I finally felt your pain with with farming because it's like, yeah, I'm still a long, long, long way away from yeah. finishing Slayer out, but every time I do it, I'm like. That's less Slayer I get to do. <laughs> yep. And that's the one that I actually really like to do. <laughs> yep. All right. Uh, let's move through some achievements here. So starting off, uh, we have uh, Lithius with 99 Farming on the 28th of July. Congratulations. TMAC 187 with 99 Constitution also on the 28th. We have Air Snipers with 99 Ranged. Jag 3 Dagster with 99 Crafting on the 27th. And then we have Ari Salot with 99 Dungeoneering on July 25th. Uh, we have Aaron Dill 20 with 99 Thieving on July 25th. Courtney with 99 Herb Law. Mike Strike 3 with 99 Defense. And No Sanity with 99 Dungeoneering. And Potato with 99 Invention all on July 24th. That was a busy day. Busy yes. day. <laughs> And then we had T Mac 187 with 99 defense on July 24th. We had Corte with 99 mining on July 23rd. Rastafa with 200 million attack. Uh, that was on the 23rd. Touchpad Pro with 99 archaeology on July 23rd. And Vivian with 99 farming on July 23rd. There you go, Shane. Nicely done. Nicely done. All righty, pick of the week time. And I don't want to rush you with this one, but we are encroaching on that three-hour mark. So we just uh, I'll keep give us a brief. fun little roundup of what this game is. Yeah, so my pick of the week is Roki, which is a little indie adventure game that came out last week. It's been kind of been doing the rounds since, I want to say, last October when I played the demo at EGX. Um, it's a really atmospheric adventure game about eight hours long um oh that's a good amount of time yeah it's a weekend game uh, made by a little indie studio in cambridge um very yeah very pretty very atmospheric yeah i like the art style very lovely art style and it's been incredibly well reviewed um i've played it and it's got this amazing dark narrative heart that really takes you by surprise inspired by tale Inspired by a Scandinavian folklore, a dark and yeah. contemporary fairy tale underpinned by a touching narrative. Yeah. Oh, an ancient uh, it really delves, delves into um, the side of Nordic folktales you don't see very often in modern media. And I found it very enjoyable and it made me cry. So <laughs> good game. <laughs> All right. And that's, of course, available on Steam. And they also sell their soundtrack, too, which is nice. Yeah, the soundtrack's on Spotify. It's lovely, really okay. lovely. All right, fair enough. Fair enough. Um, all right, that looks like a very good game. And, you know, the art style. Mm. Yeah, I'm going to add this one to the list, I think. All right, that's Roki. Um, also, just one note on Spotify. They did say that they're going to put the um, album 
from uh, Desperate Measures on Spotify because there's 11 songs that they produced. Yay. Oh, cool. Yep. That's my new running soundtrack sorted out. All right. Uh, what have we been up to on RS? Let's start with you, Tannis. Um, so I really have been focused on the quest this week. Um, I it it took a it did take me a very long time. Not because like the quest was unreasonable or anything. It's just it it takes me a really long time to um, to read the the dialogue. Boxes. Yeah, that's fair. And come and coming into this show, I I wanted to make sure I read every every word like i was just because i knew we had diana and i wanted to just be really into it and know what's going on and um and then so doing that i just really got lost in in the quest it was just so good um and so like on the side i'm playing uh my junior uh collecting energy and jumping in a dungeoneering hall on my phone so oh okay that makes sense i guess (laughs) yeah (laughs) All right. Um, as for me this week, I did the quest, of course, but I have also made the push towards Guildmaster. Well, I had around like 40 or so things left to restore that uh, I would have needed to, you know, go and excavate. So what I did is I just said, uh, you know, let's just go back to the very first set of artifacts and go grab a few of those. So I. I spent an hour or so gathering those and then gathering the materials for that, and I made the final push, and I got Guildmaster, finally. Congratulations. Nice. So um, I, had a, I had enough chronotes to buy the precision upgrade, and then I bought also a, a few others uh, along the way, and I got a nice donation of chronotes from Parnassius, and I got my Matic of Time and Space. Oh, very nice. Yeah, it just got to a point where I was feeling like, okay, these hundred plus excavations are taking a little too long. I need a boost. So I made the push. Oh yeah. And I finished Yak Track. Um I think my last task was forty three and then I used seven skips. Because I nice. really didn't want to interact with what was left. Yeah. Fair. All right. How about you, Diana? So yeah, did the quest obviously. I've been hanging out at the beach as well, uh just chilling a bit uh my main thing though is going over all the old gnome quests because there's a game jam coming up this weekend there's a narrative game jam and i'm going to have a go at writing a gnome finale quest so um wish me luck that's what i'm going to be doing this weekend cool. uh, so yeah i've been reading up on things on the wiki getting really and, back and into what the game are you going to be doing this for or in what uh what do you mean what game like a gnome finale quest yeah, for RuneScape. I know. So, so you're just so you're just writing the you just effectively writing. Oh, the story. what engine? Sorry, um, I am using a tool called Ink, which is a narrative scripting engine that then plugs into Unity. Oh, okay. Um, so I'm just writing the script. Okay, as well, so like so the, you effectively just need to write the story then. Yeah, writing the story. For Interesting. It, and then Interesting. Once that's done. I'll probably plug it into Unity and have a go at actually making a, a piece of content. Get nice. Some spec work done. Nice. Because I. Feel Talk a lot of shit about narrative for someone who actually needs to get on and write some quests. <laughs> you know, if you, I, I'd like to see what happens with this when when you do that. If you do uh, eventually um, wind up plugging it in, yeah, I'll see how it looks and I'll um, I'll keep you guys posted. It and, should be fun. And you are going to finish the story this weekend, right? I'll do my very best. <laughs> there any chance you'll be sharing should- it? I can have a go if it's in a state to share next week. All right. Yeah, we'll yeah if it's in a state to share, of course. Yeah, no, no pressure because I know. But it's been fun going back to quests, um, going over things like Monkey Madness. I forgot how much fun they were. Nice. Like, really nice old quests. Are really, they're really good. All right. That sounds really fun. Excellent. Well, I believe that does us for this episode of our SBNB update. I think we're about tied in terms of length with uh, – actually, no, we're not tied in terms of length with the needle – skips episode because uh, we do have a we do have a chunk in the middle that was edited out due to uh, the internet collapsing here but nonetheless uh, thank you for joining us Diana it's always a pleasure having you on 
Thank you very much. I apologize for overrunning yet no, again, but no, I think that's no, no, that's fine. Episodes that's fine. now, so. <laughs> that's fine. That's fine. And I'll just say that if you want uh, full show notes, you can find those at update.rsbnb.com. You can also subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google, Spotify, Pocket Cast, Stitcher, YouTube, practically anything. And it's good because you automatically get the show delivered to you. But, you know, it, it's also good because it uh, helps us with our ratings and helps the podcast be better discovered. So subscribe, update.rsbnb.com slash subscribe and Share them with your friends. And I'll just also say that if you uh, enjoyed the quest and you want to hang out with some uh, like-minded people, uh, two good, very good places to do that are Friends Chat Bits Bites and Clan Chat Clan Quest. So with that being said, we'll be back next week for another episode of RSBNB Update. Take care, everyone. See ya. Bye-bye.